Welcome to the Congress uh, 2020 planning meeting. And uh, to start us off today, I'd like to introduce our executive director for the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, Gabriel Miller. Good morning. Uh, bienvenue à tous et à toutes. It's, uh, it's great to be here this morning. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say a couple words before uh, I hand it over to um, uh, our next speaker. Um, the first time I went to Congress, I was really curious because I heard about a conference that lasts seven days and can attract 8,000 people, and it just was absolutely beyond me. Uh, how such a thing could operate or exist. And um, when I first actually was on the ground for my first Congress, this is just a couple of years ago when I joined the Federation, uh, it dawned on me that as much as it is an event, it's really a, a community. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and a community of communities where people come together to uh, share their work, uh, to reestablish and build new friendships, contacts, networks, um, and have experiences in different parts of the country. And um, to build a community for a week, uh, it start, uh, it's great to start with a strong sense of community. And that's what we've had from day one, working with Western, um, with the academic convener here, Jeff Tennant, with uh, uh, the logistics lead, Cliff, uh, and everyone else. And uh, I've continued to feel that the last couple of days here. Uh, it's just been terrific. And uh, we're so excited to be here again on another beautiful day, uh, working with you and getting ready for what uh, I think is gonna be uh, an absolutely terrific event. Uh, I wanna say a little bit about who's in the room with us today. Uh, and let's see if I get this right. Okay. Am I supposed to go through these now? Or we're doing those after? after. Okay. You can see we rehearsed carefully for this. Uh, actually, a lot of people did. You can see I missed rehearsal. Um, so let me, in the spirit of, of community and friendship, let me introduce uh, one of our hosts today. Uh, she has been uh, the acting vice president of research here at Western since July 1st. Uh, she is a medical researcher with uh, 20 years of experience. And uh, I was in a meeting with uh, Dr. Pritchard uh, and the president and the provost yesterday uh, for 30 minutes. I could tell you it was both warm and welcoming and incredibly to the point and businesslike. And uh, I really appreciated it because I think the cornerstone of a great partnership are people who can be respectful and friendly, but also very honest. Uh, so this is someone who I know we're going to get a lot done with, and I'll probably exhaust myself trying to keep up. Uh, so I, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Sarah Pritchard. Bon, merci, Gabriel, et uh, bonjour à tout le monde. Uh, C'est avec grand plaisir que je vous souhaite bienvenue à Western. Uh, we're very happy to have you here and we're very happy to be welcoming Congress 2020 to our beautiful campus and at a time of year when it, it truly will be beautiful and hopefully warm and hopefully as sunny as today. Uh, this Congress was last hosted at Western in 2005, so that's a 14-year hiatus and I know that for the academic community, in fact the whole community here, um, they are just delighted to have been able to uh, be granted this meeting this year. Uh, Alan told a story yesterday, which, which Gabriel, Alan Shepard told a story that apparently Concordia, which is where uh, Alan has just left as the rector or president and has just come to Western, apparently Concordia bid for the same meeting and they lost and were quite disappointed. But now Alan is here, so he's thrilled. <laughs> Uh, at this point, uh, I'd also want to thank everybody who is working hard to put this together. I now want to introduce to you uh, Candice Brunet de Bassaget. 
She is a special advisor um, to the provost for indigenous initiatives, and she will be doing the land acknowledgement uh, for us. She's a Muskego Cree woman, originally from Fort Albany, First Nation, which is a Treaty 9 territory, and brings more than 15 years of experience serving indigenous communities and students in educational settings. And Candace, in her spare time, is also a doctoral <laughs> candidate in the Faculty of Education. And she's completing her research, which centers on the experiences of women administrators enacting indigenizing policies in Canadian universities. So extremely interesting. Uh, Candace? Ani Sagoli Kiakula Malsi Wache in my language. I just said greetings in the three local uh, First Nations languages of this territory. Um, thanks for the introduction. My name is Candace Burnett de Bossage, and um, I'm just honored to serve as the interim special advisor to the Provost Indigenous Initiatives. I began this appointment uh, last September, and I've been um, really busy. We have a lot of really exciting changes happening at our institution, like many uh, universities in Canada. We're looking at our structures, we're looking at our leadership um, systems, and we're trying to um, respond to the calls to action around the truth and reconciliation. As a Cree woman, um, original to Turtle Island, um, but not necessarily um, from this local territory, from Treaty 9 territory, um, my community, uh, Pitabek, which is also called Fort Albany, is on the west side of uh, the James Bay, on the Ontario side. Um, so the water systems are much different and the, the, the landscape is much different where I come from, uh, way up north, it's much colder there. But when I began my work here in the London, southwestern Ontario region about 10 years ago, I knew almost immediately that I needed to work really hard to develop relationships and understand the local context that we find ourselves in. So um, I've been, been working to do that as a, a visitor to this territory and recognizing that although I am First Nations, um, I, my, my, my community doesn't come from this territory. This place is a really special place and I've learned and developed relationships. Um, we're nestled between Lake Huron and Lake Erie and we have this beautiful river system, the Thames River, the Deshkan Zibing. The Deshkan Zibing is um, the original name. The colonial project was really good at renaming and this renaming process um, happened all over Canada and really contributed to the erasure of Indigenous people's presence and the dispossession of Indigenous peoples from their land. So the Deshkan Zibing was renamed to the Thames River after a river in, um, in Europe. And so part of the work that I try to do is to surface this original knowledge. Um, the Anishinaabe are probably the longest standing living nation uh, the Anishinaabe form a confederacy of three different peoples or nations, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi people. And that confederacy, the Three Fires Confederacy, is very strong in our territory. And they've been in this neck of the woods for a long time, for thousands of years. And they have migration stories that talk about how they came from the, from the east and came to the Great Lakes and... Um, over that journey, there were seven stops. And there's oral stories that talk about that migration that are really um, integral to the indigenous archive that we find here in, in our territory. We also have uh, the Haudenosaunee people, the Iroquoian people. Uh, the Oneida in particular are really um, strongly connected to this place. Um, just outside of London, there are three different First Nations, the Chippewa of the Thames, the Oneida Nation of the Thames, and the Muncie, Delaware. The Oneida have a, a really um, important story. They, they were actually pushed during, um, during some turbulent times in the 1700s in the U.S. where their original territory is in New York State, um, what's now called New York, New, York, New York State. They found themselves being pushed through... Um, quite violent policies in the U.S. north, and 
they took a boat across Lake Erie, found themselves on the shores of uh, Port Stanley. And at that time, they uh, wrangled up as much money as they could and they purchased land. And that um, piece of land became the, the Oneida Settlement. And that happened in 1740, before Confederation. And ever since then, the Oneida people have been quite strong in this territory. And similar stories among the Delaware, the Muncie Delaware people. So we have a complex history. There's a diverse uh, Indigenous population in London. We have First Nations communities just outside of London, 20 minutes outside of London. And our institution is working hard to open up our doors, to develop uh, better partnerships, to be, um, to, to be stronger in that area. So I just share with you a little bit about the context of, of, uh, of London. And if you are curious in learning more, you can go to our Indigenous student guide and it has a, a really in-depth timeline of the local context. And that's uh, indigenousguide.uwo.ca if you're interested in reading that. So I just wanna thank you um, for your attention and uh, share a little bit of tidbit of knowledge with you about our local context. So I wish you a good planning meeting and I, I know we're really excited um, on the Indigenous front for the theme of Congress. I think that it, it certainly gives a lot of space for us to have these conversations around colonialism and Indigenous presence in and across our disciplines. So miigwech, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Candace. And I want to introduce to you uh, Jeff Tennant. So Jeff is an associate uh, professor in the Department of French Studies and is the academic convener uh, of Congress 2020. His research focuses on phonetics and social linguistics, and he is currently working on, the, on a Shirk-funded uh, research project looking at language contact and pros prosodic variation in Ontario French, which I actually found fascinating, and I went and looked up last night some um, background on that. Uh, he also currently serves as chair of the Ontario uh, Confederation of University Faculty Associations Bargaining Committee. In 2015, he was awarded the Chevalier dans l'Ordre des Palmes Académiques par le gouvernement de France. And in 2017, he received the Canadian Association of University Teachers Distinguished Service Award. Uh, we are just delighted to have Jeff uh, lead this. Uh, he and I have already had a number of conversations, and uh, you have uh, very strong leadership in Jeff and a very strong advocate uh, for your Congress on campus. Jeff? Merci beaucoup, Sarah. Thank you very much, Sarah. Good morning. Bonjour. Anin, Menogi Jagad, Segoli. And Candace, I've got to learn greetings in Lenape. That will be coming. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I, uh, my role up here this morning is uh, particularly to introduce uh, some very important people here at Western who have been uh, working on Congress and who are going to be working very hard on Congress in, uh, in the coming weeks, in the coming months. Uh, and if we could, uh, let me get this clicker going here. There we go. So I'd like to start with Cliff Fielder. My right-hand man, my left-hand man, or I'm his right-hand man and he's my left-hand man. We haven't figured out the directionality. I am so grateful for the working partnership that Cliff and I have. Uh, you know, of course, I oversee the academic side, the programming side, uh, but those of you who are at the reception yesterday know that all our academic thinking and talking and ideas cannot happen with an infrastructure. We need, it can't happen without an infrastructure, uh, and that infrastructure is not just buildings and furniture. It is people, first of all, who make sure those buildings and furniture are there, and the AV, and the equipment, and that people have stuff to eat, places to stay if they're coming from out of town, and an event like this takes massive logistics, massive coordination. And, and I think that 
I, I get a sense that actually the academic programming side in a way pales in comparison to the enormity of the operations work. Um, uh, and also a quick nod uh, from my point of view, even though it's not in my, my script to the Federation, Laura and her team, uh, Gabe and Laura and the team at the Federation, the expertise, uh, the, the wise counsel that we get from you, and I know we're going to be get, uh, getting in a way that ramps up over the coming months, is, is, is so appreciated. This is a very solid partnership. But focusing my comments on, on Cliff's work and uh, working alongside Cliff is our, I'm not going to brush my hand against this microphone one more time, uh, is uh, Mary Lee, our logistics uh, coordinator, and is Mary in the room now, or is Mary is, uh, uh, so Cliff and Mary have done massive amounts of work, uh, working with our colleagues at the Federation, and working with a whole team of people and putting this meeting together today. And uh, they are overseeing the whole operations side of Congress, which is, uh, which is massive, and I am extremely grateful for Cliff and Mary's uh, collaboration. This is uh, Mary Lee here, our logistics coordinator. So uh, many thanks for your work so far and looking forward to the challenges and opportunities and fun ahead as we prepare this Congress. I'd also like to point out uh, some other colleagues from Western whose work is essential to the success of Congress. We've put together a broad uh, steering committee and we see the names of the, the people up there to, uh, to save space on the slide. I didn't uh, put all the titles on. Could everybody on the Congress Steering Committee please stand up for a second? And I'd also invite, mm -hmm. and, I, and I would also like to take this opportunity to introduce uh, uh, a, our new Associate Vice President Research, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Burkell, Jackie Burkell, uh, who recently took on the role of Associate Vice President Research. So uh, Jackie works in Sarah's office and she will be a key leader in the work of the steering committee. Can I have a round of applause for everybody on the steering committee? And to my colleagues on the programming committee and my comment comparing the dimensions of the operations work versus programming was not intended in any way to diss all the hard work that the programming committee is doing. And our work is going to ramp up over the coming months. We've already done a lot of good work uh, shepherding through uh, difficult conversations about the theme change. And we've done some fabulous brainstorming and, uh, uh, and programming conceptualization as we develop programming so far. In the coming weeks, we're going to be moving, uh, moving forward in uh, the actual development of our host programming and further development of that programming that we develop in uh, collaboration with, uh, the, with the Federation. Uh, so uh, members of the Congress Programming Committee, would you please stand up? <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> applause for those on the programming committee. And I, I, did, I did get regrets from a lot of people on the, on the programming committee. A and there's also, uh, and uh, I, I should say that those who are not uh, program chairs or local arrangement coordinators might not have been invited to this meeting out of respect for their busy schedules. Uh, and next, moving on to a whole lot of other people uh, whose work is orchestrated by, uh, by Cliff, uh, our massive operations team. Uh, we have brought together a dream team of professionals in every area of operations at this university who are absolutely essential to the success of Congress. So we have our accessibility, uh, campus community police services, communication, conference services, uh, Congress Hub, uh, Western uh, Student Recreation Center, which is where our hub and expo will be. Could everybody on this slide please stand up? <laughs> Next in our operations team, we have data and network, electrical, facilities, hospitality. We have quite a team in hospitality and infrastructure 
And in order to save time, I'm not reading out everybody's name. Could everybody on this slide please stand up and be recognized? And finally, we have institutional planning and budgeting. We have uh, Mary again in logistics with many people working with her. Printing and bookstore parking, which is a very important topic at Western. Uh, technology, and uh, we also have our colleagues from Tourism London. I'm not sure if they're here today. They were at our, they were at our reception yesterday. Could I have a round of applause for <laughs> these collaborators? So thanks very much, and I look forward to working with you today and in the coming weeks and months. Thank you, miigwech, merci. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, when you do one of these events, uh, there's nothing more horrifying than the feeling afterwards if you've forgotten to thank the people who you work with every day. Uh, and uh, so I'm very glad that this got prominent place right at the start of the presentations. And, and yesterday at the reception, uh, President Shepard actually named all of the employees of the Federation. So he really threw the gauntlet down, so I better not screw this up. Uh, let's see. Oh, this isn't a good start. Okay. All right, so um, what I think I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about some of the key players on our team, and then I'm going to, at the end, ask our entire team to stand so you can see them and I can thank them personally. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, uh, Laura Chichowski is our Director of Congress and Events. Uh, Laura, uh, all of you will see her. Uh, she's a very busy lady. Uh, she has a great deal of experience in event planning. Uh, and uh, we're pretty fortunate to be working with her. Sonia Vanni is our Director of Member Engagement and Communications. She also has our policy and programs portfo portfolio under her, uh, which means that she oversees the development of our programming for Congress and works very closely with Jeff on the Big Thinking Lectures, on our Career Corner Professional Development Series, uh, on and on. Um, Nicola Katz, our Manager of Membership and Communications, and Nicola's been with us for six or seven years. Where's Nicola? How long is it? Six years. Uh, and uh, sh as you can imagine, there is a great deal of uh, communications work to be done uh, in the lead up to Congress, and we lean heavily on Nicola. And then one of our new team members, Gina Hill, Bir so new I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce her last name right. How do I say it, Gina? I still might not say it right, but Gina Hill Biriel. Uh, our new manager of programs and policy, uh, Gina brings a lot of experience uh, in, from a background in human rights, international development, uh, uh, in law. Uh, she certainly knows her way around a university when you take a look at her resume. Uh, and she's, I think it's going to be a huge asset to have her on the team uh, as, we, as we develop our programming for the future. Uh, the longest serving member of the Congress team and, and a legend among Congress attendees, Donna Lelievre, Congress Registrar and Administrative uh, Officer. Donna is in her 20th year with the Federation, and that means this is coming up to Congress, Congress number 20, right, Donna? Okay, close. Uh, Nikki Owens, another me new member of our team, an event planner. Uh, it's great to have Nikki with us. Kristen, another new member of our team. You're going to see a theme developing here. Uh, Kristen Bursa, uh, pro program officer, also someone who has a scholarly background. Or a background. She's a medievalist, um, which uh, I think is fantastic. It's great that we have people who've been on both sides of the relationship with our membership. Uh, it brings a perspective and an understanding of our members' needs uh, that really makes it easier for us to do our jobs. Uh, Rachel Jacob, an event planner, uh, studied music, uh, also has just recently joined our team. Uh, so everyone who's here with the Federation, could you guys just all stand up? <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, you know, it's such a complicated event. 
uh, that in a way, as much as you try to plan every detail, what you really have to have is a strong relationship underlying it because there has to be trust that the person on the other end of the phone uh, understands what needs to be done and is someone who's sharing all the information with you. And so what you need are people who are really competent but also who uh, know how to treat people right and build a sense of uh, togetherness in this project. And that's why I feel so fortunate to be working with this group is uh, I feel that, that balance from them every day. And it's, it's transferred, of course, into our relationship with Western, and I'm, I'm grateful for that as well. Okay, uh, so I have a few minutes. I'm gonna talk to you about a couple of things. I'm gonna talk to you uh, a little bit about the background of this Congress specifically. I'm gonna talk to you a very little bit about the theme, but we're gonna have some more time to talk about that later in the day. And then I'm gonna talk to you about uh, our code of conduct and uh, that might sound a little dry, but it's very important, and it's something that we want to, not just at this meeting, but increasingly spend a little bit more time talking with our associations and our core organizers with, because Congress really belongs to, to all of us. It belongs to the, the partner university, it belongs to the federation, and maybe most of all, it belongs to the scholarly associations and their members who bring everyone uh, to the event. And so when we sit down to think about the kind of standards we want to ask our community to follow when they come to Congress, it's really important that we're doing that together and we're sharing that information and doing it as a group because if it doesn't belong to all of us, it really doesn't belong to Congress. And the chances that people are going to understand it and feel obliged to, to follow those principles is much less. But before I jump in, I just want to say a couple words about Congress uh, generally as for context. Uh, and I alluded to this a little bit at the beginning. Um, uh, I really do think it's a, a miraculous event uh, to see 70 scholarly associations in this variety of disciplines uh, come together every year to do something that's absolutely essential to their mission and to do it in a way that's um, a common project where they can meet their needs together I think more effectively so that they can spend more of their time, frankly, focused on the things that I think matter most to them, which is the scholarship and the mentorship and the relationship building. Uh, it's a very unusual thing. Uh, I've been working with associations in Canada for most of my career. I've never seen the kind of collaboration it is on the scale that it is uh, anywhere else. And I think that is an extension of, of kind of the, mir the miracle of scholarly associations, to be honest with you. Uh, in a country this big to have uh, volunteer driven groups uh, that create an identity in these disciplines uh, is kind of the lifeblood of, of mentorship and the transfer of knowledge between uh, uh, established and newer scholars. Uh, it's, it's really incredible. I've spoken to a couple of people who lead associations in the States and you know in a medium sized scholarly association in the United States will have three or four full-time staff. Uh, that there's not a scholarly association in Canada, as far as I know, that has three or four staff. Uh, so to see that kind of volunteer-driven uh, community uh, in a day and age where, frankly, it's more difficult to, dr to, to maintain volunteer-driven communities, perhaps, than it ever has been, uh, it, it's, it's a, an inspiring and a humbling thing. Uh, every Congress, for, therefore, is, is a special Congress, and I think we can see how, uh, but this Congress at Western has a particular character, and, and I've felt it since the start. I felt it because of the buy-in from the institution that we felt from the first time that we visited campus and that has continued in our relationship with Jeff and Cliff and the whole team. Uh, I think uh, it's also a special Congress because of a chance to tell the story of just how much outstanding scholarship is happening here, uh, particularly in the humanities and social sciences, of course. Uh, uh, that's a, a mission near and dear uh, to my heart. My father came to Western, he did his MA here. Uh, I know how much it impacted his life and his career and the chance to just remind everyone else in the country uh, of what's happening at this university, I think is a terrific opportunity. But one other thing that makes this a particularly unique Congress is 
some challenges and opportunities we have arising from last year's Congress. And I want to say a little bit about that now. Uh, some of you, maybe most of you, may know that we had a, an incident at Congress at UBC this year where um, a delegate, a black scholar, was discriminated in, against and harassed uh, by another delegate. And we uh, conducted an investigation. We established all the facts of what happened. We took steps to sanction the, uh, the individual involved. Uh, two, two conversations, at least two conversations, came out of that experience. One was about that incident, about how we uh, determined exactly what happened and what steps would be taken. Uh, about also how can we as an organization and a community do better in the future in terms of the kind of policies and procedures we have in place. And the other side of it was this is happening in a, a broader social context where frankly every institution ha in Canada has reflecting to do and steps to take to come to terms with our history uh, and to build a more just future uh, in terms of our relationships uh, with, with blacks, with racialized people, and with, uh, of course, with indigenous peoples as well. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about where that conversation has gone. Uh, in terms of the broader conversation that both has to happen in academia, in the Federation, and in our society, uh, we have, with a great deal of help and collaboration with Jeff and the program team here, revised the theme for Congress 2020. Uh, that theme was built around, from the beginning, uh, the concept of bridging divides. This was what I talked with Jeff about and others talked with Jeff and the team about a year, probably two, year, two years ago, about an opportunity to look at the issues that are pulling people apart in our society and talk about the ideas that can help bridge uh, those divisions. But in uh, the aftermath of what uh, happened at UBC, and not just because of that event, but because of the, the issues and the realizations that flowed out of it, uh, there was a strong feeling among our members and led by the Black Canadian Studies Association that there needed to be a specific recognition of these challenges in our theme, in our program for Congress 2020. And so, uh, the theme's title has been revised to Bridging Divides, Confronting Colonialism and Anti-Black Racism. And uh, there's a description of that theme that's on our website. We're gonna talk a little bit more about it this morning and then have a much um, more detailed opportunity to, to dive into it in a workshop this afternoon with program chairs, uh, where we'll wanna make sure that we're hearing from you and also giving you the information you need for how this should inform your own work. The theme is not a commandment. It's always there as, as a guide. Uh, we'll be taking it very seriously in the program we, de we develop for this year's Congress. We'll be encouraging and emphasizing the importance of looking for connections in, your, in the scholarly association's work to this theme. Uh, but of course, we respect the fact this is a partnership and that our theme needs to be able to accommodate a broad uh, diversity of discussions. The other side, as I mentioned, is, is the more institutional, more operational side uh, of these issues. And uh, uh, let me say a few words about that. The Federation has a code of conduct, which is relatively new for, for Congress. It was been developed in the last couple of years. It was really firmed up ahead of uh, Congress 2019. And it uh, establishes uh, broad, principles for how people are expected to conduct themselves and treat others at Congress. And every Congress participant, volunteers, uh, contract workers, our staff, and of course uh, registrants and presenters are asked to agree to the code when they register. Uh, we're undergoing a review of that code now uh, and we'll have an updated version in place by December so that when registration opens in January, it'll be in place. So let me just say a few words about it. And the Code of Conduct is on our web, on the Congress 2020 website, and uh, we can make sure that link is distributed for anyone who'd like to look at what the code says now. So quickly, um, the code prohi prohibits all forms of discrimination and harassment. It's posted online and part of our registration process. 
Uh, all participants must agree to follow it. And uh, that actually is a mistake in the bottom one. We'll come back to that. Participants are responsible for their guests. That's actually not as clear in our current code of conduct as I think it needs to be, and it's one of the areas that we have to strengthen it. Uh, the code, there's an accompanying complaint procedure, or harassment complaint procedure, uh, which is the process for making, receiving, and following up on complaints. There are two types under our current uh, policies. One, it formal, uh, so um, when uh, someone decides that they want a formal, uh, a formal complaint made and uh, uh, the Federation, in uh, partnership with the host university, to investigate, document what's happened, and formally determine what sanctions are required, and informal, where uh, there'll be a, a sharing of information with the people involved, uh, a recording of that information in case there are incidents in the future, but a, 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 a full investigation or documentation isn't triggered, and that's really dependent on how the person making the complaint feels about the situation. Uh, one of the, the lines we have to walk in um, uh, investigating and enforcing the code of conduct is privacy law, in which I'm much better versed now than I was a few months ago. Uh, privacy law varies from province to province, uh, but generally uh, the need to respect confidentiality and not to use information collected in a way that hasn't been consented to by the people involved uh, is paramount. And our policy also requires us to consult with the associations uh, when a member of their association is involved in an incident and to advise them of the steps uh, that we're taking. So as I mentioned, we're reviewing and I expect revising uh, both the code of conduct and the uh, complaint procedure now. Uh, so that we have a new, an updated policy and procedure in place before the end of this cal calendar year. Some of the issues we need to address, and some of these were identified for us in the investigation we did. The range of sanctions. Right now, it, it's quite a limited list in our, our policy. We'd like it to be a little bit clearer. The things we can look at doing if someone um, doesn't follow the code. Companions. Um, one of the, uh, another one of the lessons that we learned at UBC was how important it is that if someone brings someone to Congress who isn't a registrant, that that person is also still aware of and accountable for their behavior under the code of conduct. And uh, so we'll be looking at how we make sure that if I bring a friend or a partner to Congress, I know I have a responsibility to make sure they're aware and have consented to respecting the Congress Code of Conduct if they're at any Congress activity. Uh, and then I bear responsibility for someone uh, as a delegate. Uh, we're gonna be looking at some other best practices and then what's absolutely crucial and, and frankly will be at the top of my personal list of priorities over the next several months is making sure we are in complete lockstep with Western because we universities of course have their own policies on campus and in terms of enforcing or monitoring or welcoming people, we have to work hand in glove. We're talking about hundreds of volunteers. We're talking about uh, uh, dozens of staff people. Uh, we're talking about campus security. We're talking about city police and that relationship. We all need to be on the same page about what expectations are and then also what the protocols are in the case where, in the event that there's an incident or a complaint. Um, and similarly, there are some issues around the procedures for receiving complaints and uh, uh, investigating them and then making sure that steps are taken. And uh, again, that'll be something that we need to consult with the university on uh, and reflect on with some expert advice before we revise our policies. Related to that, our communications protocols. Uh, when people hear, especially in this day and age on social media, something's happened, they need to know uh, what official information there is and what steps are being taken. So having tight, as uh, clear, uh, well uh, understood communications protocols is very important. We've established a great relationship with the communications team here at Western. I think we're in a good place to make sure that all of that's 
uh, fine-tuned and ready to go. Doing training with our own staff, volunteers, uh, uh, sharing information with associations, both as we review this, these policies, but also then prepare to implement them. I think there's a, a big piece uh, to share, not just with the people in this room, but your association presidents uh, and boards. And then over time, capacity building on these issues so that as a community, we can get stronger in terms of how we address, how we prevent, uh, and how we respond to any kind of incident of harassment or discrimination that happens uh, in, the, in the future. So yeah, we'll be reviewing and revising the code uh, that's underway. We'll be engaging experts and consulting members. Uh, I expect more information on that process will come out in the next week or two. Uh, we do want to have a code, a revised code in place before we leave for the holidays. Uh, and we will continue to include the 2020 Congress uh, Code of Conduct in our registration system uh, as a required question for people registering. And we want to make sure that we get the revised code out to associations in time uh, for any questions of, that you might get from your members about how we move forward. Uh, I'm going to stop there. Laura, I know how are we doing on time. I know I'm sure I used more than I was supposed to there. Okay, so we're, there's, just so folks know, we've got another little piece, and then we're going to take a, a questions and a coffee break. So there'll be, shortly there'll be a chance, but if there are any questions specifically about this piece right now, we could probably take a couple if anyone had anything they wanted to ask. Yeah, and we've got a couple of microphones set up if, if there are any questions. Okay, so we'll, we'll have more time to talk and dive into those details uh, later. Uh, thank you so much for, for your, your time and attention on that. Back to you, Laura. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Gabriel, for uh, taking us uh, through the Code of Conduct. And as uh, Gabriel mentioned, um, after we get through um, these first few sections, we will have a question and answer. So if something does uh, come up that you would like to address, um, we will take those uh, questions during that period. So today uh, we are here to um, I like to phrase it as almost a crash course on how to participate at Congress 2020. For many of you, it's, it might be the first time that you are a program chair or a local arrangement coordinator. For others, um, you've uh, gone through the process maybe once or maybe a few times. Uh, what we are here to do and uh, our learning objectives for you is to provide you with as much information in a very short period of time on how your association um, can move through the planning process to get to Congress in 2020. The Federation over the um, many years have been developing um, with comments and feedback from our, uh, I'll use the acronym PCs and LACs, uh, to build out what we call our planning guide. We will refer to it um, uh, as your Bible. And uh, what I would ask that you do is to actually, we are going to go almost page by page through this. Um, take the time to take notes on it. Uh, there's uh, a lot of information in here. Uh, we, we ask you to open up your memory banks and, and to try to uh, hold on to as much information as um, we can provide you today. Um, we appreciate you. Um, Congress's success is dependent on, on everyone that's in this room. And without your support, without your passion for your associations, uh, Congress 2020, um, will be all the better for it. Uh, we have a lot of uh, team members uh, you've been introduced to, both from the Western team, uh, from Cliff and, and his team, and as well from myself and Sonia and, and Nicola's team. We're all here um, for you, and we are only an email away to uh, answer any of those questions. 
So we're going to get started. So uh, from here, we're just going to start moving through the various pages of the planning guide. And uh, the first uh, couple of pages that we're going to walk through are uh, pages uh, two to eight. For those that are not here, uh, we will um, provide um, a link to a PDF version of the program guide. And so if any of your colleagues um, that you are working with in your association is also wanting to uh, have a guide, uh, definitely that electronic version is available. So the first thing we want to do is to understand that no one person uh, is expected to complete all the tasks themselves. In this guide, we have uh, a page that uh, includes uh, all the, the uh, timelines of when uh, different pieces of information are needed. So within your organization, within your committee, uh, it's not all dependent on the um, local arrangement coordinator to take care of all of the tasks. It, um, it's, a, it's a good conversation to have with your program chair and to make sure who's going to um, uh, follow the planning process. Um, just a little bit about um, how we um, have defined uh, the program chairs and it's included uh, in the program guide. The program chairs for the most part are the individuals that are looking after the call for papers. They're the ones who are looking after the content uh, for their association. Uh, that doesn't mean that there isn't a lap, uh, an overlap into the uh, logistics. For our local arrangement coordinators, uh, they have a big job, uh, and not to diminish the program chairs, their, their job is just as big. Um, they have a lot of logistics. Uh, I like to uh, coin the phrase, the devil is in the detail. The local arrangement coordinator is balancing a lot of various types of details uh, over the process. Uh, so you as program chairs and LACs are the connection to the Federation. Uh, when we are looking for questions, if any of your attendees are trying to um, gather information, if we're not able to help them, we will um, reach out to you to have you assist in answering your attendees' uh, questions. So um, as a part of the documentation we were handing out, and if you didn't pick up one, we have a list of all of the PCs and LACs that have identified themselves for all of the associations. I would encourage you to pick up one of those and um, during the coffee break and during lunch, please introduce yourselves to each other. We, we encourage that. There's an, an awful lot of opportunity to network and to um, share best practices and share ideas on content. There might be an opportunity for associations to actually work together and do some combined um, programming. So um, for here, basically, uh, it's just um, to m ensure that the responsibilities and the division, everyone's busy. I know a lot of times this is a volunteer role. It's really important to understand uh, that um, when you're looking at 70 different annual conferences taking place, We've developed a timeline with deadlines in a manner that needs to support the entire, um, I'll use a phrase, machine to continue to move forward. So we ask you to, to really take a look at, at what that um, time of timeline is and to uh, work with your program chair to uh, meet that. You'll notice in the responsibilities, there are areas that include uh, requesting uh, your meeting rooms, uh, requesting your catering and audiovisual orders. Um, through that, you'll also be uh, submitting your conference program. You'll, uh, every week or every two weeks, you'll be receiving emails from the Federation. Uh, we, um, they are referred to as PCLAC organizers emails. These are emails that will come into your inbox that will remind you of upcoming deadlines, 
of upcoming um, uh, monthly uh, conference calls that we will do with you. Uh, so please, when those emails come in, take a look at them. Uh, they're an easy read. We, tr we get to the point um, and provide you guidance um, as things are moving forward. We encourage you to participate in the Countdown to Congress uh, monthly meetings. We have them at the top of the month in October, November, and then again January right through to May. Uh, these conference calls uh, can be done by teleconference. They are over the lunch hour period, and these um, uh, teleconferences last about an hour, and it's going a little more in depth into some of the uh, tasks that are coming up. The, the teleconference call is also an in-person meeting here at Western, so we will be identifying the, the meeting space that it's taking place at um, so that you can come together. Part of that countdown call is to talk about best practices. So it's an opportunity for some of our seasoned organizers to share some of the, the um, uh, lessons learned that they have from their conferences with other associations that may be doing it um, as an LAC for the first time. So they are um, an integral part of, uh, of the planning of Congress. As you can imagine, um, pulling together 70 associations under the Congress umbrella um, can be quite tricky. Um, the planning cycle uh, identified on page five of your guide is where each of the tasks are listed, where the deadline is, and it also includes the page numbers to reference a little bit more explanation on what that task item is. That list is in checklist format. Um, as a tool for you to keep track of. You can pull it out of the uh, guide if you want or you can copy it and put it on um, your desk or set it up in Outlook just to, to keep you on track. Another key tool is the Congress website um, for both you as organizers and for your attendees. The website includes a wealth of information on trip planning, and programming, such as our big, big thinking lineup. It includes information on hotel accommodations. It also includes your conference pages. And also um, under um, register is where all of your attendees will go to uh, register for your conference. The access to the organizers portal, which is a special uh, login access is for you. It can be found from the Congress website in the upper um, right-hand corner. As you're developing your annual conference website, which we anticipate that most of your associations uh, do, we recommend that you build links from your website to the Congress web pages we have listed. This will help your attendees to have all the information they need to participate and get the most out of Congress and the annual, and your annual conference. The Organizers Portal is a website um, software that's specifically designed as a secure hub for your association organizers. It's used both to share information and resources with you and to collect your association's needs and requests for Congress. The portal is a secure site and you will log in with a username and password to access it. All PCs and LACs and other association organizers which you have identified for Congress 2020 will be given access to this system. You'll receive details on how uh, to uh, do this uh, through your personalized uh, email and that'll be sent on Monday, September 30th. And that will be the day that we will open the portal New for this year is for those who, um, associations who wish to use a generic email address to uh, allow access to the portal or to complete the many forms that you need to um, do. We'll be providing instructions on how to set that up. So watch for your email on Monday and uh, this information uh, will be made available and uh, if uh, additional questions are required, um, you can reach out to us by email. Within the portal, you'll have access to various tools, documents, 
logos for the con uh, Congress, historical data on, on your associations. Um, the, uh, there'll also be the access to all of the forms that you need to submit, and there'll be some additional resources as well. Um, they, ha they are identified um, in your program guide as well on page seven. The portal will be preloaded with a wealth of information for you, and we are continually updating it. So it's important to bookmark it on your, on your computer and um, to refer to it. For example, the slides of today will be uploaded into the resource. And as you can see, we have a camera in the room, so we are videotaping it as well. So for those that have uh, not been able to attend today, they will be able to uh, listen to the entire presentation. If you look at area one um, on page five, you'll see a screenshot that um, this is the home page on the home page of the organizers portal. This is where your conference dates are also listed. They are also listed in the planning guide. This is information that we receive through the member update form that was submitted by your organization in June and early July. If those dates are not accurate, please reach out to us immediately um, so that we can continue our planning, understanding who um, will be on campus on each day. Your estimated conference attendance was provided to us through that same uh, member update form. The number of complimentary passes, that'll be allocated to you. So these are registration passes. Your Congress account number. This Congress account number is a number that is assigned to you um, in collaboration with Western and is your um, conduit to make sure that all of the billing that takes place from your activities here at Congress go on to your uh, account. Regarding membership, there is a reference if you are a Federation member or not. There are some forms where eligibility starts with being a member of the Federation. So it'll be important for you to take note of that. And included in this section is the name of your PC and your LAC team member. As the planning cycle goes on, if there are any changes to your program chair or your local arrangement coordinator, please share that information for us as we use it to continually keep our um, email um, uh, list up to date and um, for sending those important pieces of um, information. Continuing on uh, the organizers portal, uh, we have a, uh, an area where we uh, list all of the different resources. As those resources, those PDFs, um, are made available, uh, they will be activated on this page um, under reference. And um, if there are any additional reference documents that you believe you need, please let us know. We're, we're happy to continue to um, add to this referenced uh, document list. As a part of that reference section or resources section, we also have our branding and logos. And uh, we have our branding identity kit as well. So you can download those PDFs and you can also access um, the logos so that you can use them on your website. You can use them on your conference uh, program. Again, these areas are continually updated. So please um, uh, come back and take a look. There's a whole page dedicated to Laura to insert after upload. <laughs> um, so there is a, a whole section of the uh, organizers portal that will give you all your historical data. How embarrassing. Um, it'll include all of your registration numbers for past years. It's going to include the conference fees that your association has charged in the past. Uh, it's also going to um, provide you with what your history on how much revenue has been collected from your, your conference fees, as well as how much your expenses have been in past years. It's also going to um, provide you with um, who the PCs and LACs have been for the last few years, which you can then uh, reach out to if you have any questions. Um, the information for 2020 is uh, a prediction based on what 
what your associations have provided. Uh, so as you're looking at putting together your budget and uh, putting together exactly where you think your revenue and your expenses are, are going to be, it'll be important to, to understand is the forecasted attendance um, key to your budget planning. We referred to this page earlier. Um, this page, uh, you'll see, uh, just as an example, that uh, there is a status. That status is based on um, someone from your association going in and starting a form. So if you have multiple people who are accessing the forms and they log in, it'll identify that somebody within your association has started that form. Uh, so as a part of the generic email address, um, if more than one member of your, your planning committee want to access a completed form, we're recommending that you do have a generic email address. I mentioned earlier that we do send out uh, a frequent number of emails, uh, the PCLAC organizers emails. These are um, sent on Thursdays and they will start next week. So you'll be receiving a, an email about the organizers portal on Monday and then you'll be receiving your first uh, PCLAC organizers email on Thursday. If by the end of the day it has not come into your inbox, um, we would ask you to let us know and we will determine if um, we use constant contact. So if in the past you've um, declined receiving emails from the Federation, we'll need to go through a process for that. Um, another piece uh, of uh, information there is um, if you're working with your uh, IT administrators, you may want to also look at uh, whitelisting um, the various email addresses that we have. Checking. So these are the three email addresses that you want to take down. So the organizer's email, this is the email address that uh, you as program chairs and organizers uh, will reach out to us on. The Congress email address is for our attendees um, to communicate with us. And um, we have both the English and the French uh, attendee uh, email address. Another resport, um, support is the Countdown to Congress uh, meetings that we have. Um, I've already referred that they are a one hour meeting. They are um, at the lunch hour. And uh, for uh, each month, they will be targeting the tasks and the deadlines that are taking place in that upcoming month. Um, so any information, any questions you want to bring, uh, those countdown calls, those are created and presented for you. Uh, it's to help, it's to answer any questions, and it also allows other organizers to also hear those questions. So it is an important piece of, um, of, the, of the work that you do. So um, with the teleconference um, uh, uh, software, we're using Zoom. So uh, if, uh, if any of your um, uh, institutions or offices have uh, any concerns with the software, we are using a secure teleconference system. Uh, so Zoom is uh, the, uh, the product that we use. Um, otherwise, um, uh, Cliff will uh, be greeting everybody uh, once a month uh, in the meeting room and uh, we have that information already loaded on the organizers portal and it'll be available so you can check um, under the meeting section of the portal to get that information. So now I'm going to pass over the, um, the, the wand to, to Donna Leliev. Uh, Donna is the person on the other end of that email, organizers email and um, I will say to you that she is extremely diligent about what she does and how she port, supports our Federation members and our Congress annual conferences. Um, if you've not met or uh, um, 
uh, seen Donna at registration at Congress, uh, she will become your best friend. And, and many times we've been told that she's a lifesaver. So I'm gonna ask our lifesaver to come up and take us through registration. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. No pressure at all. <laughs> okay, so, so on, uh, I guess we'll just get started. So on page nine and 10 of your guide, um, you'll find the draft association conference schedule. Uh, we will have a total of 70 associations joining us at Congress 2020. So check your association conference dates. Uh, are they accurate? If not, we need to know as soon as possible. Please email us if there are any uh, errors. Check the date for your president's reception that will be hosted by um, Western University and please include it in your program. For each of your associations, you may also have uh, your own welcome reception or president's reception, but we encourage you to also include this reception in your program as this is the great opportunity to network with other association attendees. Uh, the R, on this schedule represents the date of your associations um, and, and has been allocated for the president's reception. So on page 11, the financial information, each association will have their own account. Through the registration process, the Federation collects your association conference fees on behalf of your association. All Congress expenses incurred at uh, the Western campus are tracked to your account using the account number that we will be provided to you in the organizer's portal. Uh, Off-campus services or uh, venues cannot be charged to your account. After Congress, once invoices are received from the university, the Federation will compile your expenses and revenues and will send you a statement of account. Uh, we are anticipating sending out uh, the, those invoices as soon as possible after Congress. At that time, we will ask your association to review and respond uh, with any discrepancies within two weeks of receipt of those invoices. This will ensure that the Federation and Western will be able to rectify any queries in a timely manner and provide you with a um, financial statement. So on page 11, the Association Signing Authority only the, the individuals that you identify on the association signing authority form in the organizer's portal will be given authority to um, charge to your association's account for the purpose of Congress. Charges may include catering, audiovisual equipment, photocopying and printing, bar services and contractor assistant labor. Updates to your signing authority can be made throughout the planning process by modifying the form already completed. So that deadline is uh, October 18th, 2019. So printing services, which is on page 11, we anticipate, sorry, we anticipate that your conference budgets are top of mind at the moment. Please include Western printing services on your list of vendors to receive um, a quote form. No. Oh, sorry, to receive a quote. <laughs> by contacting them earlier, sorry, I'm lost here. By contacting them early, you will have an understanding of what services they can offer you and costs based on your job requirements. Any printing accepted through Western Printing Services will be billed to your association account. You will need your account number for these orders. So registration fees. The Congress fee and association conference fees are broken down into two components. The payment of your fees is mandatory for all attendees of associations, including speakers, presenters, panelists, administration, management, organizers, and those chairing or attending a session. The Federation reserves the right to charge associations the Congress registration fees for any of their attendees, including speakers, presenters, panelists, administrators, managers, organizers and those chairing or attending an association session um, who attend sessions that uh, fail to register. So please make sure that your attendees register for Congress. Everyone must register through the Congress registration system. 
for the specific association in which they are participating. This will be included, uh, sorry, this will include an association affiliate, co-located uh, or subgroups that are meeting under your association umbrella. Every year, non-registered Congress attendees cause a significant loss of venue that can result in increased registration fees overall. Please let your members know that by not paying their registration fees, they withhold much needed, fee, uh, much needed funds from your association, and don't forget to register as well. Congress fees have been set for 2020. There is an early bird fee uh, prior to March 31st, and then a regular fee as of April 1st, and an on-site fee starting February, uh, February, Friday, <laughs> May 29th, 2020. Um, these fees are also outlined on page 12 of your planning guide. Each year, each year we issue attendee and organizer surveys and the results of these surveys are very important to us. A question we are asked in these surveys is what does the Congress fee cover? The revenue that is collected supports the long-term development of Congress and ensures that the infrastructure of services to support an eight to 10,000 person Congress are in place for many years to come. In your guide on page 12, we list some of the highlights of what that fee covers. I would like to highlight one important cost saving benefit to our participating associations and that is the Congress fee also covers all credit card merchants fees that would be otherwise be applied to the association as an expense, thereby reducing the potential income you collect from your association conference fees. Each association is responsible for setting their own uh, association conference fees. You are encouraged to keep your uh, conference fee structure simple. So you can see page um, 12. Your association fees for Congress need to be established and then submitted to us through the organizers portal by completing the association conference fees form by the deadline of October 18. To help determine your registration fees, review your historical association uh, data overview available in the organizers portal to compare registration numbers from previous years and the fees your association changed for the past years. When setting your fees, ensure that all costs are covered in your association's Congress budget, such as catering, audiovisual charges, furnishings, banquets, speaker costs, special events, off-site venues, program printing costs. Um, new to this year, we have also included in the organizer's portal in the reference section, a budget template to help you with establishing your conference fees. It's important to note that any association should ensure that these conference fees cover all expenses, which will, pro which will provide you with a surplus of funds to use for future association activities. Make sure that when you are um, building your budgets that you factor in all of your expenses. Make sure that you take your time to factor in all the elements of your registration fees. Please ensure that you have reviewed your conference uh, structure carefully as we will be uh, launching the registration site in early January. After that date, it is more complicated to add missing fees. The only registration system that can be used uh, for your conference, pre-conference workshops is the Congress registration system. Congress attendees register once they register and pay for Congress. To ensure less confusion for our attendees, the use of other commercial external registration systems to sign up uh, program is prohibited. The only exception is the use for um, call for papers or similar software which associations use in managing program requirements. This is for all the elements of your conference, such as um, pre-conference workshops, banquets, programs. The Congress registration system is not connected to any association's membership system. It is the association's responsibility to review their Congress registration uh, lists to verify membership status of each attendee who has selected your member versus non-member conference fee. 
there will be a link in the organizers portal that will provide you um, with real-time access to your registration list starting in late January. One attendee challenge we have every year is their understanding that your association membership fee is not included in your, con in your association's conference fees. Although there may be some exceptions, we collect the association's conference fee at Congress. Please help us to help your associations to understand this by providing some registration information on your websites and then provide a link to the Congress 2020 register page. When communicating with your association, uh, with, with your members, please ensure to explain to them that they are still required to register for your association's uh, conference on the Congress website after paying your membership fees on your website. Uh, we welcome any suggestions from you in clarifying this challenge. Registration will open in early January, which creates the highest volume of traffic on the Congress website. Online registration for your members and non-members is fast, safe, and secure. We accept all major credit cards, Visa, Visa Debit, MasterCard, MasterCard Debit, and Amex. Um, no cash or checks on site. On page 13 of the guide, you will find information on how the registration reports are managed for your conference. Reports are available to download via the organizer's portal. We will co cover this more in the afternoon's workshop. You can log in and keep track of your attendees in real time to see who is registered once registration opens in uh, early January. Remember, the Congress registration system is not connected to any association's database and cannot verify membership status. Review the list early and continually, and remember to um, verify membership status on your association's membership database. Um, due to the sheer volume of registrations received from mid-March through to Congress, we appreciate your cooperation in managing this on an ongoing basis. On page 14 of your guide, you will see examples of what Congress badges will look like, which will help you to monitor if attendees have registered for your conference while on site during Congress. The badge on the, badge on the right has text starting, um, which is uh, stating open events. This includes, this indicates that uh, this individual has not registered or paid for any association and is only attending open events. The badge on the left with a small, uh, it is kind of small, but does have the acronym of the association um, that the attendees have registered and paid for. We strongly encourage that association organizers monitor these badges on site and send back any non-registered attendees to the registration desk to purchase a registration for your association. By doing this, it helps to maximize your association's revenue potential and ensure that expenses for organizing, for organizing and conference remain sustainable. Last year, we reintroduced the community pass, which will again be available starting the week of Congress. This pass does not allow access to your association's conference. Member associations of the Federation receive complimentary passes for a limited number of people. The uh, number of passes granted to each association member is based on the number of registered attendees at your previous conference. Each association has the dis uh, discretion to allocate the complimentary passes to whomever they choose. Associations have in the past applied, uh, they're allocated to invited guests, speakers, PCs, LACs, presidents, administrators, or other organizers. Your LEC will receive a link to register online um, your community passes into the registration system. The deadline to complete your complimentary uh, pass registration is March 31st. On page 15, consult the Congress 2020 website for information and links to Immigration and Citizenship Canada. The email confirmation which attendees receive from the Federation is automatically generated and does not represent an individual to attend Congress um, for visa purposes. So step one, register your annual conference. Once registered, CIC's special events uh, unit will provide you with a group code which attendees can use on their uh, visa applications. 
Step two, create um, and send your letter of invitation to your international visitors, attendees, speakers. Canadian associations are responsible when they host business visitors from abroad. Details and the requirements for the letters of invitation and available are available on the um, Citizenship and Immigration Canada website. The Federation does not issue letters of invitation and unfortunately cannot assist with this process. We have now completed uh, the section one and two of the planning guide and we open it up for questions. If there are any questions about this section or information, please make um, your way to one of the microphones to ask these uh, and anyone can hear so that uh, we're happy to address whatever we can. Okay, either we're really doing a good job or we've overwhelmed you. <laughs> um, what was that? Little of both. Little of both. <laughs> um, there'll be more uh, question and answer periods, so, um, or uh, during lunch if you want to uh, come and uh, approach uh, either uh, uh, Donna or I uh, with your individual questions, you're more than welcome to. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Sonia Fanny to come to do programming. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. <laughs> I had a yogurt. I had fruit. I feel energized. I put on a sweater because I was cold. Um, and I'm ready to talk about programming. Um, I hope you are as well. I hope you're ready to hear about it. Um, in the next few minutes, uh, I'm not going to read through the programming section, and nor will uh, my colleague Kristen when she comes up and talks a little bit more about it. Um, I prefer to uh, present a little bit of content that's complementary uh, to what's already in the book, uh, and then we can, we'll have a couple of minutes at the end of our section to address any specific questions. Also, I will shamelessly uh, promote the fact that we have a programming workshop. Um, some of you, unfortunately, would have to split yourselves in half uh, because you're both programming uh, chairs and local area co coordinators, or you're there representing both. So you have a difficult decision to make. Uh, and uh, uh, don't worry, I understand if you take the logistics one. Uh, there's a lot there. On the programming side, just so you know what I would be talking about, uh, it's looking at ways that we can collaborate and leverage existing structures and resources uh, to put together conference programming um, that can maybe support more interactions and more collisions among, um, among Congress attendees and members of various associations. And uh, this year we want to push it a little bit further, we being uh, the Federation, and walk the talk a little bit more ourselves and reach out to associations more proactively so that if ever you're uh, walking around Congress halls uh, in May and June next year, and you bump into uh, a researcher that you've been really interested in, in your own discipline, but you had no idea that researcher happened to be there because there was a lack of communication and uh, people uh, perhaps worked in a very siloized way. And by people, I also mean uh, the Federation is guilty of this too. We all get really busy. So um, we're hoping that uh, this year we can work more closely uh, as far as the Federation programming goes uh, and extend an arm out proactively to our associations and uh, try to group interests in theme buckets and see how we can work together. So uh, obviously we can't keep adding more and more programming, but it's really about streamlining. And that's what the workshop is about. Um, so if you, if you can't make it, it's okay. And you can reach out to my team, myself, uh, Kristen, Gina, uh, anytime following this if you have questions. Uh, but the sooner we talk, the better, because things kind of get on a rail and move very quickly, as you've noticed. Uh, is there a clicker? Or is this the clicker? Oh, look at that. Oh boy, the big green one with an arrow. Hang on, what do I point it at? Oh, wonderful. Um, so t the, the information that I'd wanna present here in terms of programming, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, super. Ah, et en passant. Je suis francophone, je sais que la majorité des gens dans la salle sont anglophones, donc euh, j'ai élu de parler français, euh, anglais plutôt. Euh, mais si vous avez des questions, puis vous voulez euh, poser vos questions en français, allez-y. 
Euh, et si vous avez besoin de ces informations en français un peu plus tard, euh, je suis ici euh, au courant de la journée, donc ça me fera plaisir avec mon équipe de répondre à vos questions en français, dans la langue de Molière. Um, the purpose of Congress, ooh, pa, 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 I have to remember that. The purpose of Congress uh, is to serve the scholarly associations and universities uh, that make up the Federation's membership. And it's meant to be a launch pad for new ideas. Uh, it's meant to uh, encourage and provide a venue for networking. And a large part of that depends on logistics. Another part of that is through the programming. Um, so we really want to uh, uh, work towards, as I mentioned earlier, an approach to programming that uh, streamlines so that we compete less with one another and we recognize, we being the Federation and the, the University, Western, we recognize that the primary purpose for you being a part of Congress is your own conference programming. Um, and within that, if we can create those collisions and work horizontally across our disciplines, um, it's all the better for it. Um, You may or may not know that we had a Congress working group um, that looked at the sustainability of Congress in the future and how we can continue to tweak um, an event that has existed for 89 years. Um, and certainly if it existed that long already, it's because it has learned to adapt over time. So the Congress working group was reflecting on uh, other changes that Congress will have to go through to ensure that we continue to be relevant as a community with this event moving forward. Um, I guess two of the big lessons that came out of the Congress Working Group report, uh, my takeaways, are that we have to seek a better balance in the amount of Congress programming overall. Um, and that means, uh, you know, we put a lot of great energy, there's that P again, uh, into the content, and then a lot of people can't make it to it. And that's the reality of it. And it'll always be a characteristic or a reality of Congress. Um, but we're really interested at the Federation side and we're accountable to our members to be able to program more smartly. Um, and there's a little bit that has to come from all of us to make that happen. Um, and the other lesson that I take from the Congress Working Group report is that we have to make a growing effort to uh, support and facilitate and enable collaborations uh, and interdisciplinarity to respond to the growing interest in interdisciplinarity. Um, so you'll see that that's kind of the flavor that this year is taking. So we have some returning funds that encourage this and some new initiatives. Uh, and of course, given the Congress theme this year, although it's always been a priority, um, we're all the more responsible for ensuring that equity, diversity, inclusion, and reconciliation Um, constitute large, integral parts and growing parts of Congress moving forward from a programming perspective. Um, I think I'll move to perhaps my next slide. Um, when we talk about Congress programming, a lot comes to mind. To a PC and LAC, it's what is your own association putting on as programming, and that's the association's programming, for sure. So that's first and foremost the, 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 the beginning point and, and entry point for associations. Uh, Congress programming also uh, includes federation programming and host university programming. And sometimes they intersect. Um, so through big thinking, they intersect. Through they being Western and federation. Uh, through career corner, they intersect. I'll give you an example where they don't intersect. Uh, pedagogy hub. Uh, pedagogy hub Uh, you'll hear more about it later, but that really sits right now with, uh, with Western. Um, so the, just as you would expect, uh, the logistics of Congress uh, are complex, so is the programming. Um, so I have the beautiful task to lead a team in the next couple of months to, to work on, on this alongside you guys, and we're, we're thrilled about it. Um, So uh, on the theme this year, which uh, uh, you saw earlier, I think what's pretty incredible about it is that it emerged from the community. Uh, it was something, and then it had to be reworked. It had to be reworked, uh, and I guess I often talk about, I think I was talking to M Michael O'Driscoll from University of Alberta yesterday about this, but um, uh, tactical performance is sticking to the plan, and adaptive performance is not sticking to the plan when things change. And we had a moment to do some uh, adaptive performance. And uh, that was really spurred on by our own community. I think we heard from roughly 30 associations that said they were in support 
um, of a, the Congress theme changing to be able to draw more attention to colonialism and to anti-black racism as a result, uh, first and foremost, of the June 2nd incident at Congress this year. So I think if we want to be pertinent in the future, we have to be able to be adaptive uh, when our community speaks to us. So that's a good sign, and we thank you for it. Um, but now we have the collective responsibility of ensuring that this wasn't just paying lip service, that now there is a sincere willingness on the part of all stakeholders to faire un clin d'œil at the theme, to be able to uh, uh, underscore it in some way. And if not through your programming, um, perhaps through your approach to programming, to really be conscious of reconciliation and uh, equity, diversity, inclusion in its broader sense, if not directly to anti-black racism, or by allowing your members some time to be able to attend other events organized by others that might be focusing on that content. So those are kind of the three ways that I would see you can engage with the theme. You can engage with it directly with your own content. Um, you can promote and support the others and hopefully have your members take part in it. Um, and the third is perhaps in your approach, your methodological approach to programming. So I think uh, that's the most of what I, I wanted to say um, at this point. Um, we're looking at organizing six panels, so the, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the other type of programming. Uh, I'll invite my colleague Kristen to come up. Um, but essentially, uh, the workshop this afternoon, we hope to present a couple of theme buckets and see where there might be some intersections. I've already spoken to a couple of you in the room. I know there's interest in uh, social work and, and uh, sustainability in the environment, in uh, indigenous healing or indigenous health. Um, so these are all really boding well with some of the areas that we want to be more proactive in. Um, so that's all for now. I think I'll invite uh, Kristen. No? Oh, whoops. Jeff. Jeff. P -p Please come up. Thanks. Merci, Sonia. I am going to make an effort, first of all, not to strike a microphone with my hand. I'll try to be mindful of my voiceless bilabial plosives as well. That's the p sounds anyway. Okay, enough phonetics. Uh, Western University programming. Can we, uh, can I, I've got the magic green arrow to move to the one slide about which I will uh, be speaking uh, at the moment fairly briefly. So uh, Western University program, uh, programming, and as Kristen and Sonia will tell you, Federation programming, it's a work in progress, which is particularly normal at that, this stage, and per particularly considering the evolution of the Congress theme since, uh, since June. Uh, I uh, echo Sonia's um, observation, a uh, very wise observation, that we really need to engage seriously with this theme as it has evolved, and there, there are different ways we can do it. In Western's host university programming, we're going to engage with it uh, very honestly, seriously, directly, uh, and we are going to ensure that we offer a, a good quantity of high quality uh, programming that addresses uh, indigenous issues, indigenous scholarship, and that addresses anti-black racism. And so we are, we are in the process of doing that at the moment. And uh, we have, uh, I showed on the, one of the slides earlier, the members of our programming committee at Western that draws colleagues from different areas of uh, different faculties and uh, our affiliated university colleges. Uh, and the programming committees discussions have been ongoing for quite a while and we have for several months we have gathered quite a number of ideas that we're working on fleshing out at the moment uh, and also in addition to that and there are many people in the room colleagues from Western who were identified to me a few months ago uh, by the Dean's offices of their faculties as being involved in the work of associations that meet at Congress you will have received emails from me about our programming advisory committee. Actually, I've just got the name right. I uh, mislabeled it the advisory programming committee. Uh, it, it can be either way, anyway, which reminds me of a Monty Python sketch I won't quote here. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so I am going to be, uh, first of all, I'm going to be getting the list of uh, 
Western colleagues who are attending this meeting or signed up for this meeting to update my list for the Programming Advisory Committee. And within the next week, I will be sending an update, uh, updated email uh, on the status of the development of our Western programming and with a call for suggestions uh, for input for uh, particular aspects of, uh, of our programming. Uh, so uh, the, uh, let me move on through these three categories of programming and very briefly, the first category we've chosen to give a rather long name with a short form, the festival, to what is traditionally called our host university programming. At the University of British Columbia this year, it was Circles of Conversation was the title. We chose to call it Gathering at the Forks Festival of Public Scholarship in the Humanities and Social Sciences, or the festival. Why Gathering at the Forks? The initial version of the Congress theme before the change was uh, Gathering at the Forks, Bridging Divides. And in our negotiations to revise the theme in light of the circumstances from June 2nd, we removed for the sake of brevity of the uh, long title of the theme, we removed the Gathering at the Forks. It's very important to us at Western that we maintain that. And when you, if you look at the, uh, the uh, Congress site now, as uh, Gabe mentioned earlier, the description of the theme is up. We have a new description of the theme. It, was, it is, was of utmost importance to us that we maintain the reference to the land in the theme in our programming. That is essential uh, to, uh, to the theme. It has been from the start and our engagement with indigenous issues and indigenous perspectives. Uh, why a festival? Uh, we're taking a public scholarship knowledge translation approach uh, to our host programming. I'm working quite closely with Josh Lambier, a PhD colleague, uh, a PhD uh, candidate uh, and colleague in the Department of English, who has a great track record of organizing uh, public humanities festivals. And so we'll be, uh, we'll be uh, uh, working out our, our cultural and our academic programming under that rubric, the festival. It'll be, be, it'll be a, quite a diverse program, but top priority to anti-black racism and to indigenous issues and various treatments of those theme elements. We will be uh, continuing the new tradition started by our colleagues at the University of British Columbia this year to have a pedagogy hub. We have, uh, uh, I've been working with the Center for Teaching and Learning and we have a, an outline program together I will be running that by our programming advisory committee and getting that subgroup together, but we're well underway in planning that programming. Those of you from Western will know our Center for Teaching and Learning has lots of resources. We have our spring and fall perspectives conferences and there's, there's a lot of uh, professional development expertise that, uh, that we can apply there. And finally, we're working on developing family programming. Uh, we're going to have a family zone uh, where parents can bring their children uh, there will be toys, there will be books, there will be, it will be a, a comfortable place for, uh, uh, for accompanied children. We will also be offering uh, day camps uh, where children uh, uh, can be uh, uh, registered and, uh, can, uh, and so enjoy a whole lot of sports and other activities uh, while their parents uh, uh, participate uh, in, in Congress. And we're also working out our, uh, our daycare arrangements uh, as well. Uh, so that's in a nutshell the structure of our Western University programming and the development of details is, uh, is a work in progress. And so uh, Western colleagues in the room, uh, you'll be hearing from me with uh, requests for input and with a, a, a more detailed update on where we are in developing that. And also just uh, in conclusion, uh, in reference to an important point that Sonia made in her remarks a moment ago, we are looking to uh, avoid over-programming Congress. So integration of uh, host university programming, federation programming, and associate, association programming is, is one of our priorities at the moment. So I think from today on, the discussions that we're going to be having today and this afternoon will be a jumping off point uh, for conversations we'll continue to have as we seek to find a way to get our open programming integrated well with the open programming uh, of a, uh, on association programs, uh, have uh, open programming 
listed on a number of association programs. So I'll, I'll conclude there. Thanks very much and looking forward to continuing this conversation. I'm Kristen, and I'm a lot shorter than Jeff is. So I'm just going to attempt to accommodate that fact. How are we? Am I audible? Excellent. Am I also visible? I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm really short. Um, hi. So as um, Gabriel mentioned earlier, I'm the new program officer at the Federation, and I'm pretty excited to be attending my first Congress from this perspective. So I first attended as a master's student in 2009, and I've been to five different Congresses since then. Um, so this has been kind of fun for me, seeing how the puzzle pieces get put together from this side. So I'm gonna briefly just go through a few aspects of programming uh, today with you. So specifically, I'm gonna talk about big thinking, career corner, featured programming, and the Congress Expo. Um, and although I'm the one up here talking about this, I do also want to highlight that a lot of this work is done in very close collaboration with Jeff and his team at Western. Um, so it's not just us. So to start with, oh, I didn't even need the green arrow. It moved all of its own, like magic. Um, okay, I promised I was going to do that. Uh, so this is a lecture or panel series uh, that's open to attendees and to the general public. We're looking at four events in 2020. Uh, this is streamlined down from previous years when we had more. Um, and part of the, the reason for that is in response to feedback uh, that makes it, you know, it's just difficult to attend everything when there are so many different things running. Um, and for that same reason, we're looking at scheduling these uh, across different time periods this year. So we're hoping maybe to have some at lunchtime, but also some in the evening so that uh, there are a few more time slots available for people to attend. Um, as you can see, the, the kind of our aim uh, content-wise for this year is really to engage closely uh, with the Congress theme of bridging divides, confronting colonialism and anti-black racism. Um, as we have updated information on the lineup, you will find it on the website. Um, and I'll also just reiterate that the full description of that theme is also now available uh, in both languages on the Congress 2020 website. Uh, so that's a brief intro to big thinking. Uh, Career Corner is something that I have definitely attended in the past as a graduate student and an early career researcher. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware of, of what this is, this is also joint um, effort between the Federation and Western. So we have a series of professional development workshops that are aimed for people uh, at all different career stages. So some will be a little bit more targeted to different uh, different stages and some will be more broadly applicable to uh, to anybody. Um, so these are just some some examples of some themes and topics that we'll be looking at. Um, so things like CV and resume building, publishing and marketing your book, equity, diversity and inclusion, public scholarship, um, funding applications, that kind of thing. So there's a lot going on um, um, in this. We're looking at about a total of 20 different career corner workshops spread throughout the week of Congress. Uh, so there should be something, hopefully, that appeals to everyone. Um, and as, again, as a former attendee, I really encourage you to let your student members know that this exists, because I've spoken to a lot of early career colleagues at Congress who didn't know what was going on, and I was like, guys, come on, you need to come to this workshop, it's useful. Um, so Career Corner. Uh, Congress Expo. Um, so this is also super exciting, being the largest showcase of academic books in Canada. Behold, all the book emojis. I don't know why they're in black and white, um, but this is just an indication of how many books you will find. It's super exciting. Um, if you have ideas for new exhibitors, please feel free to let us know, uh, and you'll find this information in your planning guide as well, so you don't need to frantically write that email address down. Um, so in this space, which is, uh, you can't miss it, it'll be located near registration in the information hub. Uh, you'll find publishers and exhibitors. There will also be book launches, um, signings, that kind of event takes place there. There's an expo passport game that rewards you for how many booths you visit. You can win a prize, yay prizes. 
very exciting. Um, and you'll also find the update date list um, of exhibitors coming um, on the Congress website. So I should have, yeah, here we go. So the final thing that I'm just gonna briefly introduce you to today is a featured event. So this is what we refer to, um, uh, the way that we refer to open events uh, that are often uh, organized in collaboration with partners and sponsors. And you'll see some of the, uh, the logos of previous partners and sponsors up here. Um, and this is where we're also hoping to be able to collaborate with you as member associations. And this is something that we'll be talking about in the programming workshop this afternoon that Sonia mentioned. Um, and we're really, again, looking uh, at ways to create open events. So these are events that all Congress attendees can come to um, using interdisciplinary approaches, focusing on, again, specifically on aspects of this year's theme, um, as well as on issues that are applicable to humanities and social sciences more broadly. Um, funding for research, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, all that kind of thing. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there. Um, we can definitely speak more about this in the workshop this afternoon if you're interested. Um, and I will pass on to Nikki to talk about association programming. Nikki is a little closer to me in height than to Jeff, so we might be okay microphone-wise. Everyone, I get to figure out the green button. Yay, is this it? Okay, so back to more um, logistical things. So um, in terms of association conference details, this process is facilitated by the association uh, conference detail form, which is found in the organizers portal going live on Monday. The purpose of this form is to gather information that will be published on each association page on the Congress 2020 website, including a short, compelling rationale that will spark interest from potential attendees, which would be typically no more than a paragraph in text. Um, you don't want to make it too, too long. Keep it short and interesting. The association pages are high traffic areas with about 14,000 people visiting them between January and June each year. So we want to make sure that the information is populated in advance to help you increase your registrations. Please note that this is only one step of your association programming and doesn't replace the need for you to submit a PDF of your <laughs> conference program. And the deadline for this is November 15th. All right, so each association is responsible for developing your own program. This is both a blessing and a curse. We recommend that each association use the time slots shown in this sample schedule on the slide. The reasoning behind this is based on a lot of feedback that we've had in past years from attendees as well as associations. People wanna be able to present and attend other association conferences. So it's important that if you're all having your um, sessions at different, uh, different times, it makes it more difficult for people to actually uh, partake in your association conference or different conferences. Some tips you might want to com uh, consider when creating your program is to start your regular conference programming at 8.30 and end around 5 p.m. Be consistent with your programming time slots for each day of your conference. Host special events and receptions in the evening after 6 p.m and allocate about 15 minutes of time between each session to allow attendees to travel between rooms if that is necessary for you. Schedule at least two coffee breaks per day for your conference. Add extra time to your breaks to allow for networking, which would be about half an hour or longer. Um, leave enough time in your program for about an hour and a half lunch, as oftentimes big thinking will uh, fall during the uh, lunch hour, so this allows people to partake in big thinking as well as check out the Congress Expo. It also lets uh, attendees network with each other as well as with other associations. Um, so if you can avoid scheduling sessions during this time, that would be fantastic. Um, on page 20 of your planning guide uh, is some information about open events. A really great way to attract other Congress attendees and get them interested in your conference is uh, for future years is to open up some events for all attendees to attend. Um, opening one of your sessions means that anybody can attend whether they've registered for your conference or not. 
and any association that is officially participating in Congress 2020 can open your, a session, so that's available to everybody. Uh, we have open programming, you can do it too. An important thing to remember when deciding to open event or session is that additional fees or separate registration uh, sign-up process cannot be used for these events. This is to ensure clarity and limit confusion for general Congress attendees. To open a session or event, you simply need to complete the open listing or open event listing form via the organizer's portal. The organizer's portal is going to be your best friend along with this planning guide. <laughs> uh, just remember to complete one form per event if you're opening uh, multiple events. Each one gets a separate form. Uh, if submitted by the deadline of March 6th, your open event will appear in the online calendar as well as in the printed Congress Essentials Guide and our mobile app. And should any important details about your event change after you submitted the form, you have the opportunity to update uh, the form and, uh, by April 17th. Anything received by April 17th will be in our Congress Essentials Guide. Anything after that will only be reflected on our website and our mobile app. Okay, um, so we know that open events are only a part of your association conference program, but another important part is your program in general. Congre uh, sorry, Congress attendees, media representatives, and scholarly pub publishers are often looking for Congress programs ahead of time in order to prepare for Congress. Uh, it helps them determine if they want to register or if they're interested in connecting with your members. So ensuring that we, the Federation, has the most up-to-date version of your conference program is really important because it can greatly enhance uh, the attendees' experience. You are responsible for, for submitting a PDF version of the conference program to the Federation for, uh, via the organizer's portal. So please submit this with a spe uh, specified file name so that you can be correctly linked to your association page. So the file names pretty easy. You need your association number, English acronym, French acronym, year, month, day. It seems like a lot, but it uh, is very helpful to everybody involved. <laughs> Once received, the programs will be posted on your individual association webpage within the Congress website. So the preliminary uh, program is due March 20th, and the final one is due on May 1st. Okay, on to the mobile app. So this is in page 21. This is very exciting. Um, in Congress 2019, it was our first year to have a mobile app, and about 39% of our 10,000 plus uh, attendees downloaded it and were using it. Uh, that was very exciting for us. We didn't know what to expect, so we were pretty happy with those numbers. Uh, with that being said, it was a, a first time for us, so we learned a lot, and we took into consideration all the feedback that we received from the attendees. So, many of you may have researched the potential of uh, building your own app and found that costs and or resources uh, were restrictive. So, in working with our mobile app partner, we're able to bring uh, one of the mobile app modules to our associations, to you guys. This is the interactive agenda. With that said, uh, we are introducing the opportunity for all of the associations to include your conference program in the interactive uh, agenda on our mobile app. Uh, your attendees appreciated the ease of use of planning their schedule around the open events, but the overwhelming comments we received was that they wished that their association conference agenda was also included. So here's your chance to include your program this year. We are working as quickly as possible to uh, launch this initiative, but we still have a few um, things to iron out and finalize some details before um, our official launch, but um, if you want to uh, learn more information about this or opt into uh, this potential, then um, let us know by October 18th and we'll be in touch with you about all the details and costs on that. You also have the option, um, this isn't like a final opt-in, <laughs> you can uh, cancel your participation if you're not interested by the end of this year. Okay, so um, as the organizers of your association, you have a responsibility to support your presenters to ensure that they are fully prepared to present at your conference. The success of your conference starts with presenters who are well prepared. On the Congress website, we've prepared some useful tips and instructions on how to get the most out of their presentations. 
So please include the Congress website, which is on the slide, as well as um, in your guide, uh, with your, in your correspondence with your presenters. Included in the organizer's portal will be an accessible presentation guide, which we recommend downloading and sharing with your presenters as well. To eliminate any last minute surprises on site, it's important to share with your presen presenters the audio visual equipment that you're providing that will be in the meeting room during their presentation. A reminder is that um, Western University is a PC computer based um, campus and therefore they don't have the uh, capacity to accommodate uh, Mac computers on the spot. So um, please bring your own Mac adapters if you're going to be using your Mac computer. I will now invite Sonia back up to stage. Thank you. How's everybody doing? All righty. Um, we're going to talk about the funds that are made available to you. Uh, when I'm done that section, it's going to go back to Laura, and then there'll be a break after that. Is that correct, Laura? Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, so f how many are in a PCLAC position for the first time? Raise your hands. Wow, that's nice, that's fantastic. Why on earth are you doing this? I'm kidding. We really appreciate it, hang in there. We're here to support you. Um, it, that's great to hear. So for some of you, you may or may not be familiar with some of the funding that already exists um, for you. The first two uh, are returning funds, they've existed for a while. It uh, doesn't mean that they're perfect, but uh, for the most part, <laughs> people are, are aware of them. The third one is new. It's a pilot. We're finally launching it uh, this year, um, and I'll tell you a, a little bit about that one as well. Um, the International Keynote Speaker Support Fund um, responds to one of the, uh, it's not as a result of, but it, it kind of points to one of the recommendations, again, from the Congress Working Group report. If you've heard me talk about this already and you haven't uh, found a copy of this yet, I, I really recommend uh, that you do. It's on our website or you can write us and we can send it to you. It's available in French et en français, en français et en anglais plutôt. Um, and it consists of 28 recommendations. Recommendation 22 talks about internationalizing Congress and um, finding ways to support our associations to turn uh, an eye, uh, open a window to the world. Um, so we're hoping that you can leverage this fund and perhaps bring collaborators, uh, uh, conference uh, speakers from uh, other parts of the world outside of Canada. Um, the interdisciplinary session fund goes to right to the heart of it, uh, uh, creating collaborations, uh, working alongside other associations um, that might have a similar complementary view or might have a contrasting view. And think about how stimulating that would be. Um, and that is when different opinions are, are brought together uh, around one same topic. It's extremely powerful. Um, my first experience with Congress was in 2018 uh, in Regina, and I went to um, programming, I think it was Canadian Historical Association, now I'm not sure, Michelle, if it was yours, and CPSA, Political Science. Um, but there were a series of um, uh, statements made around uh, indigenous issues and knowledge and approaches to history uh, it was uh, political, it was engaging, it was difficult. I see Michelle there. Um, but it was, uh, it, it, the learning was incredible. And uh, sometimes when you're learning, it's like you're exercising. Your muscles might feel a little bit of pain, it might be a little bit of uncomfortable, uh, but you work through it as a group. And collectively, something really special happened there. Um, and then the Congress Graduate Merit Award is as a response from uh, as a response to our association saying that they, they really want to find ways to continue to encourage the participation of graduate students. And we know that it can be prohibitive at different points of one's career, especially when one is an emerging scholar, uh, to be able to uh, afford it. Um, that being said, it's not meant as a subsidy. It's actually a merit, a first and foremost, a merit-based award. So it's meant to recognize academic excellence, uh, and it's also meant to help offset the costs associated with coming to Congress. So that's a novelty this year, and we'll talk about it uh, a little bit. Um, what I should mention is that the first, uh, the first well, really, all three funds uh, are meant for registered uh, associations. So we, 
as you heard, we have more associations than those who are coming to Congress who have formally registered, but these funds are made available to those who will be participating in Congress. Um, for the fine print, if you're part of an association that hasn't, uh, uh, that uh, for whom there hasn't been a ratification at the annual meeting of their membership, we consider that as well. If you're registered to come to Congress, you're a new association, you have to plan your programming. Uh, we open that up to you as well. Um, you would go to the organizers portal, big surprise, to be able to find the application forms that you'll need to be able to apply. Um, we heard a bit of feedback and as of last year we started moving back. First of all, we took the two funds, uh, international and interdisciplinary, if you allow me to refer to them in, with those words, um, and we pushed back the date, made, made it the same date so it's easier to remember January 31st. We know that that may pose challenges, um, but we also have to advance and there's a ton of deadlines as you've, as you've seen from booking space, uh, booking travel, uh, so we hope that you're able to, to make that deadline that, that's pretty mandatory. So January 31st for both funds. Um, for the Congress Merit Award, it's a little bit different because all associations have a different time frame for their call for proposals. So um, we have to be ready to roll um, as of September 30th and r continue to roll until April 17th. What we commit to is getting back to your associations with news on uh, who gets the Congress Merit Award um, within 15 business days. So within three weeks, um, you should be able to hear back. And now there's a whole bunch of steps between that point, uh, but I'll try to outline those as simply as possible, and they're also outlined uh, in your book. Uh, the program guide, uh, par pardon me, the planning guide, has lots of information in it. Um, we, we're trying to lighten the load <laughs> uh, and to print less. So the critical information is in there, but we've also created documents that include um, answers to frequently asked questions, and we've tried to add a little bit more meat, and we've put those documents up on the organizer's portal. So you'll be able to access them there, and uh, you don't have to frantically take notes. Um, the information is there, and if you still have issues with interpreting the information, we welcome you to contact our team, and we'll go through it, and we'll work through it together. Oh, did I hit every, hang on a second. Uh, okay, did you move up the slides? Oh, I'm gonna move back. Uh, is that the first one? There we go, okay. Um, so international keynote, um, there's a few things that apply to international and to uh, the interdisciplinary funds, and I think overall what has to be stated is that they're meant uh, to help support uh, your costs. They may not offset your costs completely, so it's a good idea to not rely on that budget solely, but to see it as influx and you, you have this coming in, it's infusing your budget, uh, but it might be difficult to organize the event that you want with only these funds. So I'd like to state that first and, and foremost. Um, it's a popular program, uh, whether it be international or interdisciplinary, we, we get a lot of applications, it's competitive. So you have to think through uh, your pitch um, and uh, try to leverage the people that you're bringing in uh, maybe for more than one thing. Explain that if that's your, your point. If it's flat out, we just want catering, um, that can also work, but um, uh, think through that. You have to advocate for yourselves uh, to some degree, but generally we try to allocate as much as possible. We don't hold back on funds. We try to really uh, give everything out year after year. Uh, that's what we're there for. The funds exist for you, uh, but there's a lot of you. Um, now, the conditions is that these have to be open events. That means that you're allowed to have, of course, your own conference programming that's closed for your own members, of course. But these sessions that get funded by the Federation have to be open to the general public as well. Um, so they have to be fully integrated into your conference program. And what that means is that um, you shouldn't have uh, concurrent or competing programming during those time slots because it makes it really difficult for your members to choose where to go. Um, and we don't charge for them. They're open, as I said, to the general public. Um, uh, questions that come up often when people are considering applying for these funds and how to go about it is, uh, can you combine them? Can you take an international keynote fund and then an interdisciplinary and put them all together? You can't, not for one. But you can apply to both as a lead applicant in one year. That means that if you're with um, uh, uh, Canadian um, Jelly Bean Association, and the Canadian Jelly Bean Association wants to bring in an international speaker, they can apply, and if they put together a good pitch, they'll get their money. 
they can also, the Canadian Jelly Bean Association, apply for the interdisciplinary. That would mean that they are responsible, as the lead, to approach other associations. Um, uh, and uh, I was going to try to name another candy, and they were only coming to me in French. L'Association, la Société Canadienne de Barba Papa. Um, and uh, they would approach them and get their buy-in, and that would mean that both associations would integrate the same session at the same time, on the same day, in their respective conference programming. On top of that, the federation chips in with its own uh, promotion. Uh, when we see associations trying to work together to address complex issues, um, we put our shoulder to the wheel and help, help promote that as well. Um, so we have structures in place to enable, um, that would be, th those are usually the most common questions that are asked about that. Um, when do you get your money? That's another common question. Unfortunately, we don't give the money out before. We understand that that's a principle that works better if your money's in the pocket um, prior to an event, but it just causes too many logistics and liability issues for us. So as you're planning this, you have to remember that you'll get a reimbursement for those costs. But you'll, you'll get a reimbursement based on some conditions. The conditions are that you report back to us after the event and that you fill out a post-event report form. Um, and you have until June 19th to do that. So the, the moral of the story there is after you're done your event, say your event is on June 5th, the last day of Congress, you don't have that much time to be able to do your report. Frankly, the report is eight questions. Many of those questions are your name, your association, your email address, so this is not complicated stuff, guys. It's better, best to do it, my advice, do it when it's fresh. Do it on your way home, your flight home, do it at the airport, do it in the hotel, get it over with. It's not gonna take a lot of time. The most critical question for us in that form is the eighth one, the last one. Please fill it out. You'll wanna fill it out when I tell you what it is. It's who the money goes to. If you don't provide us with that detail, there's a massive delay from an administrative level at our end, I was at the receiving end of that this year because that position wasn't staffed, so I did, I did this myself. And it's reaching out to associations during the summer with everybody's out of office and trying to figure out who we write the check to. And then you get the name, but then you don't get the mailing address. <laughs> so moral of the story there is let us know who we need to send the money to. Now, we will not send the money to your guest. We will not send the money to the person who ended up filling in and paying. We send the money to the association because that's who we have a relationship with. So it's important that maybe that person you've checked in with is the treasurer and you we trust that you have your own mechanisms within your own association to ensure that when the treasurer gets the check that that money is reallocated where it needs to go at your end. We just can't time 70 get into those details. Uh, but what we can do is ensure that you get prompt payment once you get your post-event report form to us. Um, so we'll get your post-event report forms, we'll issue checks. It's not PayPal and it's not e-transfers. We're just not able to move that fast and we don't have that infrastructure in place. So it's a good old check that's mailed, uh, snail mailed to your association. So that's the, when you peek behind the curtain, <laughs> it's still a little analog, but we're making some progress. Um, uh, a lot of the same ideas at the interdisciplinary, I'm conscious of time, uh, so I know those details are there. We'll be talking about these a little bit more in the workshop this afternoon. We'll have some handouts of those documents that we talked about that I've mentioned that are on the portal. We'll have some hard copies. They're available both in French and in English online. Um, and in terms of the Congress Graduate Merit Award, this is our newest, uh, our newest award. Um, we've developed, I hope I brought it up here, uh, I did not. We have a, um, a formula, we've based it on the membership size of your association. So every association coming to Congress will get at least one of these awards to give away. They're worth $500 each. Uh, if you're between zero and 100 members, you'll get one. If you're uh, in a 901 and up, so if you have 901 members and up, you'll get six. And if you fall somewhere in between, you'll get two, three, four, five, but it's based on your membership size. Now, what's important is for you guys to walk away from this and to know how many of these you'll have. So we can confirm that number with you today, but we'll also do it formally via email. Uh, in the next week or two, probably the next two weeks, you'll get an email stating how many of these you're gonna get, but we can confirm that number with you today. Um, 
it's a two-step process to apply to this. A graduate student would see your call for proposal. Um, say your association has two awards to give away. Um, we would hope that you're able to gather, so your graduate student would apply to the association um, and submit a few pieces of information to be eligible. We have some eligibility criteria. Once the association has received these, because all associations have not been created equal, we can't enforce that you create a committee. Some people are working on a corner table, volunteers, and they don't have that capacity. So some may just elect to give this task to one person. Either way, whether you create a committee, whether you have a buddy that you work with, um, or it's just you on your own, um, there's some eligibility criteria you have to make sure you go through. Once you have received your applications, and say you have more applications than the number of funds you have, you have to make a decision as to which ones are the most deserving, and that's through the 250-word abstract, and ensuring that um, this supports academic excellence. Um, so it's based on merit, not on uh, uh, financial need alone. Um, once the association has made that decision, and that association has, for example, two awards to give away, the association will fill out an online form with a few questions um, that allow us to be able to pay the money out to the deserving graduate students. So you fill out the form, it comes to us. Within 15 days, we let you know, indeed, there's no problem. As long as you've outlined and you've answered the questions, we're not um, gonna pose more judgment on your it's really up to the association to make, to, to, to make the judgment. We're just there for checks and balances to make sure that the information is, is there and that we have what we need to be able to pay, um, uh, to give out the $500 checks. Now, how will the checks come to the students? We wanna make sure the students attend. We wanna make sure that they got there. So we'll be in, we need to know that the badge was picked up by the student. Um, and then uh, once that is done, because we have that information, upon return from Congress, we issue our checks out to students. And how do we know where they live and what their name is? Because you will have provided that for us with their mailing address in the application. And how will you know where they live and what their name is? Because they will have provided it to you uh, through their application process. Um, so we understand that it's a couple of steps. Um, I worked on this personally quite a bit. I consulted with about 15 associations um, got a lot of feedback, and everywhere you turned, there was a different way of doing it. And we delayed this last year. We wanted to launch it last year, and we didn't. So what we did is we took last year's amount and this year's amount and combined them. So there's quite a few more to give out this year than there would have been otherwise. We're hoping, because we're receiving money from Shirk for this, we're hoping that there'll be uptake and that we can go back to Shirk and say, you know what, it was a pilot, we ran it, there's interest, let's do more. And then we can take a look at, at, at the amounts and maybe we adjust the amounts uh, in the future. Um, but we're hoping that uh, there'll be uptake and we're hoping that it'll mean that we can enable more students to take part. Um, that, yeah, go ahead. Oh, we might need you to grab a mic. I'll take this one question, uh, but we'll have a, a question period afterwards and you can come see me after. It's just a, hopefully a quick clarification question. And that is, um, uh, it says that we're nominating, and so is there another evaluation process of the quality of the applications after the association submits it to you? Or is the six, or the two, or the one that the association put in, that's just the one? That's just the one. We're okay. just making sure that we have the information needed. So the establishing the criteria, we have some eligibility criteria because we want to sure equitable like we want to make sure it's an equitable process across the board as much as possible, but we also want to give some flexibility to the associations as the subject matter experts to be able to make those decisions themselves. So we just want to make sure we know who the money's going to, that generally you've checked off the criteria, but we're not, we're not going to be analyzing that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, that being said, uh, I'm just going to uh, move ahead. Uh, quickly mention, uh, I think Candice is gone. Um, but I wanted to mention something very important that will be very useful to you. Uh, Western has been working diligently at creating a document that will be very useful to our associations. It's actually already been very useful to me myself because I've seen some drafts and taken a lot away from it. Um, Candice Brunette de Bassiguet uh, is leading this, this effort and I, I salute her, uh, her work because it's very difficult to be able to pull together the type of information that's in here, but it'll be very useful to you. It includes um, information about uh, uh, the 
Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, uh, the Lenape work and the Adawandaran, uh, the Deshkanzibi, it talks about treaties, it talks about history, and a little bit of what you heard Candace speak to this morning um, in a digestible, accessible form. It will be bilingual, it will be posted on the organizer's portal, uh, and it will have recommendations as to how to make a short, medium, and longer length land acknowledgements while you're here. And I just want to highlight that uh, the Federation itself has some work to do to not just read a land acknowledgement, but to actually craft a story around it that's built on sincere relationships. So heads up that um, we're going to try to do this better. We're hoping that you'll be interested in that as well. And it's take a little bit of time to figure out what the proper pronunciation is. There is a pronunciation guide in, in, the, uh, in the booklet, so I've, I've just been practicing a little bit, not too good at it yet. Have a couple months ahead of me to be better at it. Um, take a little look at the history. Understand when you're doing a land acknowledgement uh, what you might be pointing to uh, as a visitor perhaps on this land. Um, the Office of Indigenous Initiatives um, will be wrapping this document up, and when they do, we'll make sure you know about it. We'll leverage our communication channels with you so you can access it as soon as possible. Uh, one thing to be mindful of, and something that often comes up at this point, is will we know who to reach out to if we want a local elder um, to come in? And that comes from a very sincere and a good place. We just have to make sure that we're not overburdening the capacity of the local Indigenous communities. So we don't know that at the Federation. We have to take our cues from uh, the Indigenous Initiatives um, Office. So when they're good and ready and they have a sense, they'll provide some guidelines, and then after that they may adjust them depending on uptake. I think that's all I wanted to mention. I think it goes back to Laura. Oh, Q&A, okay, voila. There's a lot there. Oh, there's just a lot there. I'm a teacher. I know that when there's no question, you, you, you got to give a little bit of time. <laughs> if you do have questions, feel free to come up. En français ou en anglais. Please. I, yes. I have a, a quick question, again, in terms of um, indigenous practices, land acknowledgements, but also in terms of um, their smudging uh, ceremonies. So last year, uh, I was told by Congress that smudging was not allowed on campus due to um, a request that had been made by the local groups saying that this was not allowed in their territory. Uh, a request came in from an Indigenous member of our association to do smudging and just wanted to make sure that uh, whatever checks were taking place uh, in terms of facilities to make sure alarms didn't go off, etc. And when I gave this answer, I was blasted, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, it was completely insulting to this person that this, uh, this practice wasn't being allowed. So I'm just bringing it, we, we managed to work this out, and I'm just bringing uh, this to, to see what your process is this year, and to make sure that we're respectful of, of all of these requests. Mm. It's a really great question. Uh, I'm really glad you brought it up. Um, I've encountered this difficulty myself uh, in another part of my life. And uh, I, th I think we have to remember that <laughs> it sounds ridiculous to actually articulate it this way. But when one is non-Indigenous, I'm European, I have to not assume that all Indigenous people are going to have the same rights and uh, um, customs and traditions. And smudging is, part, is there for some, but not for all. So um, the complexities around UBC is that um, um, we were working with communities that did not, uh, the local communities that were um, on whose lands we were did not smudge. It wasn't a custom for them. So I don't have a clear answer. I'm not an expert in this. But this is where I would encourage you if, you, if you find that the document doesn't provide the answer that you're looking for, or it's ambivalent or too, it's ambiguous, you don't know the, the way forward, probably there's one or two other people that are feeling the same way. And it would be really responsible and great of you to contact the Federation, and we can reach out to uh, Western and to the Office of Indigenous Initiatives to be able to clarify that with the subject matter experts so that we don't complicate it more than it needs to be and that we go right to the matter. And it could be that you're putting your finger on something that's complicated anyway and that it involves consultation and uh, chatting with the stakeholders involved. 
So th I'd love to be able to say, when that happens, do this. But uh, I don't know enough about that, and it's a bit too complex. So I would tend to want to pull together the stakeholders uh, oh, and, and our host for some advice. Jeff? friend and colleague Sonia Vani. Um, the guideline document, uh, the Indigenous uh, guidelines document to which Sonia referred, uh, the draft version has a section on smudging guidelines. I think I can say with confidence that we don't have the, uh, the, the cultural and territorial complexities that uh, we had on Musqueam territory in, in that part of what's called British Columbia. Uh, this is traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Nunapewak, and the Attawandaron. Smudging is uh, a, a quite standard Anishinaabe spiritual procedure. Uh, what we are waiting on is uh, a procedural, uh, a rather spiritual practice, rather. Uh, we are waiting at Western the approval of a draft policy on smudging. What we're likely to have is a, uh, is a process whereby, and this is to be confirmed, whereby an association can make a request uh, well in advance saying we would like to hold smudging in this location at a particular time. Uh, I don't foresee any political obstacles to it. We just have to make sure that uh, there, uh, the, the procedure that is outlined in a policy to be approved is followed regarding fire and, and smoke and health regulations. Uh, but my understanding is smudging will be supported uh, under, you know, under defined uh, regulated circumstances. D'autres questions? Sur les fonds, sur le protocole autochtone? N'hésitez pas, si vous avez des questions plus tard, écrivez-nous. Merci. Bon. So, now we're going to move on to uh, logistics. And just as our colleagues on the programming side put their pitch in for the programming workshop, um, the logistics workshop will be most excellent as well <laughs> and very interactive. So uh, you do have options um, for after lunch and, and we encourage you to uh, look at both uh, the logistics and the uh, programming workshop um, and uh, take advantage of um, um, smaller group uh, conversations related to the topics that we'll be bringing up. Uh, we're going to go into logistics uh, at this point, and I've brought up my two colleagues uh, so that we don't have too much uh, extra bouncing on the stage here. So uh, we'll uh, be moving through the next um, part. So on to logistics. Uh, so we're now on pages uh, 25 to uh, 33. We're getting there, folks. Uh, requesting your meeting rooms. It's one of the largest and most important pieces of the planning. Uh, within the organizer's portal, you will um, be moved through the process to basically identify all of the meeting rooms that you need. Um, for uh, the associations, it's important to understand that the meeting rooms that you used last year are not pre-populated in this form. Uh, you're starting with a clean slate because we don't know if your program uh, last year was two days and this year you've changed it to three days or vice versa. So it's your responsibility to get your room requests in. You may be saying to yourself, but we don't even know what our program looks like. The call for papers isn't closed. We haven't opened the call for papers. We recommend that you take a look at your historical data, talk to your program chair, talk to your association, and start with what you've done in the past as a benchmark. When you're putting your meeting room requests in, you'll be doing them on a day um, period, and that will include plenary sessions, your breakouts, your workshops, your executive or board meetings, 
uh, your annual general meetings, your receptions, your poster sessions, and any other events that you're doing. It's a fresh start. You have an opportunity to change um, what you need. Um, take the feedback that you received from your previous LAC and make sure that you identify the right size of room. This is your opportunity to make sure that you've, you've um, provided uh, the Federation and the host University Western uh, with the information. The Congress team at Western University and the Federation will not be able to support your conference events if your requests have not been made through the organizer's portal. It is critical. Uh, if your requests are not made through the organizer's portal, um, we, we just won't know about it. And it can cause problems for your associations and uh, it will create challenges when you get on site. Uh, we have had problems each year where we have had associations who um, have connections. Uh, the LACs are from the host university and you believe that you can go and request special uh, spaces, uh, special boardrooms, uh, and uh, you believe that you've got everything arranged. It's not been arranged. If the university and the Congress Western team is not aware that there's an event in that room, it can't be managed uh, properly. Um, to give you an example, we had an association book a departmental meeting room for their association separately from the Congress request system. When the group arrived for this session, the, uh, the audiovisual console was locked. They then started to call into the Congress um, uh, info uh, center uh, asking for the AV company to unlock their console. Um, after triaging that call, it was determined that the uh, AV uh, department didn't even know that that meeting room was being used. Because of the resources that the university are using, they were not able to be able to unlock that um, console uh, because all of their services had been scheduled and deployed to the buildings on the uh, Congress or on the campus that were assigned to Congress and unfortunately they could not help uh, that association with that meeting space. It creates um, challenges for you in front of your attendees and it also um, uh, creates um, uh, an unfortunate customer service situation. We've also had it where a banquet was ordered um, off of the room request system. The attendees and all the uh, and the uh, president of the association arrived at a venue they thought was uh, arranged for catering, and there were no catering. There was no banquet. So we we wholeheartedly ask you keep your requests in the uh, room request system. By all means, uh, Cliff is a, a phone call away, uh, and we're going to talk more about the special spaces uh, at Western. Uh, that are a part of the Congress uh, program. If you have a nugget of a space that you really want to use, the room request system will allow you a field that will let you ask um, for a specific room. That will then trigger Cliff and his team to either say, okay, yes, we've received uh, approval from the faculty to use that space during Congress, or no, I'm sorry, the faculty has already declined us being able to use that space. But that will be a conversation that will take place um, between yourselves and Cliff and uh, his team. So in, on, uh, so in order for us to, to support you, um, please use the, uh, the, uh, the organizer's portal and the room request process um, to make all of your meeting room requests. We'll go further into this this afternoon with the workshop. But um, basically, there's a tendency uh, to take a look at your conference program and request a meeting room for session A, which is an hour and a half, then a separate meeting room for session B. Please take a look at your program and see how you can use one meeting room for the, for the entire day. And that way, you can identify that it's a nine to five. 
uh, period. Um, and then internally, you know that you're gonna use it for your keynote first thing in the morning, then you're gonna use it for session A um, and potentially session C, and then after uh, lunch, you'll be using it for your afternoon sessions. We're gonna go through this a little bit more in this afternoon's workshop, just to make sure that uh, the concept uh, is understood. And uh, this is, this is a, uh, an important piece. As you look at your historical data and you see your association has ordered four rooms, uh, those four rooms aren't for your individual uh, sessions and they forgot to order uh, for their general session. It means that they're using that same room uh, in a double duty. The um, room request form will ask you a number of details. Please provide as much um, detail as you can during this room request um, period. The reason for that is that it will it'll help significantly the uh, Western team in allocating your space for you. As you can imagine, uh, and Cliff used the term Tetris the other day, it is a pure Tetris process. Some associations are always concerned how early in the planning stage that this process takes. It takes, um, we've worked with Western, they've extended the deadline to the end of November. However, it does take a full two months with a Christmas holiday in the middle of that to take all of the information that they've received from 70 different associations and try to plot it out in the, what Cliff, 30 plus, 32 plus buildings that are here. Pardon? Currently. Currently. Um, so it's important to um, work, with, work with what you know, um, anticipate what you, if there are changes that you're making to your program and work within that. Take into consideration your accessibility requirements. If you're looking at um, 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 having a keynote speaker come in with accessibility needs, make sure that you identify that, that it needs to be a um, uh, non-tiered uh, classroom, uh, that there, there is no stage, that the speaker, if they happen to be in a wheelchair or, or have mobility issues, that they can still get to the stage. Also have an understanding um, for your timing. Each campus, each host university tries so hard to make sure that all of the um, conference meeting rooms are all in the same area. But there are times based on your specific requirements that you may be moving attendees potentially from one floor to another or from one building to another. The university looks at that. That's a part of this puzzle, a part of this Tetris. They're, w they're trying their best to accommodate and please everyone, but sometimes there are compromises needed. If, um, and as I mentioned before, if you have a specific room um, in the campus that you're looking to use, um, please identify it. Um, all the requests are reviewed on an equal basis. It's not first come, first serve. It's not we accommodate the large associations and the leftovers go to the small associations. It's not done that way. It's, it's done in a very fair and reasonable way and in a manner that will allow the university to accommodate as many of the requests that are coming in. Um, for example, last year there were 1,650 individual meeting room requests. On, a, on the Monday, we had 400 classrooms operating at exactly the same time. So you can imagine the volume of what that means. So we appreciate your um, cooperation and collaboration on that. Um, room allocations will be published in the organizer's portal on February 10th. And from February 10th to February 28th is a key period for you to take a look at what you've been assigned. You'll have an opportunity to reach out to Cliff and his team, discuss potentially the challenges that you have, or maybe by then you already know that the room requests that you made this fall, you don't need as many meeting rooms. Whatever that looks like, please share that information with Cliff. If you're happy with what you um, have received, um, or are willing to be 
uh, meet halfway. Um, for us, if there's been no response before February 28th, we anticipate that no news is good news. If you're here at Western, please go and take a look at the classrooms, understand what the um, meeting room space is, understand what you have at the front of the room, and that will inform you when you uh, go to order your catering and your AV and your furnishings. If you have um, uh, questions or there's been new developments since um, arranging your meeting rooms, you've added a poster session because you've had an excellent call for papers pro process and you want to um, include a poster session. As soon as you know something like that, please reach out to um, Western and Cliff uh, will work towards that. Um, if um, after February 28th um, there are no other changes, those rooms are, are finalized and those rooms we will reopen uh, the system and as of February 28th your catering orders, your AV and your furnishing orders will be placed. Furnishings. Um, what part are you taking? Excellent. <laughs> so with furnishings, um, the furniture is either fixed or movable. We will be putting a document in the organizer's portal that will allow you to take a look at a potentially up to a 10-page document that will show the name of the meeting room and also if uh, it's fixed or movable furniture. So if um, uh, it's normally a standard classroom setup, but it's movable furniture, uh, the host university has probably identified that that room can be used f um, for either a theater style or a U shape. Um, so you want to take note of what you have uh, in your room. Once that room has been assigned to you, it is fixed. So if things change, um, you need to make sure you work with your program chair. Be, be open in communicating with them. Let them know what's happening. Um, let them know what type of room it is. And um, if, for example, uh, within your own agenda, you may want to reassign one of your rooms that was originally assigned as a breakout, now is uh, your keynote, something like that. That you can do within your system. Um, and you would advise um, uh, through the room request system that that change has been made. For furnishings, um, that includes uh, panel tables or head tables at the front of the room. Uh, so some of the classrooms only have a console, a podium at the front or a table. But if you're looking to do a multi-speaker uh, presentation, when you're in doing your ordering, you'll actually be asking for a panel table uh, for five, five people, four people. The same goes when you're ordering for your poster session room. You could be having posters uh, during your coffee break. So is, uh, if you've uh, just assumed you could use the hallway outside for your poster sessions, well, poster boards take up lots of space. So again, it's a part of the, the process um, that you'll go through. Um, included in your planning guide, um, just after section 7.0, is the, we're happy and pleased to say, uh, and thanks to Cliff and uh, his AV and catering teams, we are able to provide you with your catering and AV and furnishings menus in there. So right away, you can use that as a part of your budget planning, uh, and that information during this afternoon's, here's another plug for the workshop, during this afternoon's workshop, we'll have Chef uh, from Western uh, uh, participating so that uh, he can answer any menu questions because I know that with a lot of um, food allergies and uh, special needs and dietary restrictions that uh, that must be um, uh, front and center for you um, to understand before going into catering order. Uh, for audiovisual, uh, one of the items during the room request period this fall is if you're planning to have simultaneous interpretation, simultaneous interpretation takes up space in a classroom. Please indicate that you are planning to use simultaneous interpretation. Um, with the 
uh, equipment that is already in the room. We also, uh, if you already know that you are going to videotape, if you um, are going to have any other special audiovisual, you know that now, enter it into the room request uh, so that when, again, Cliff and his team are looking at those room requests, that will be um, taken into consideration in trying to assign the rooms. If you plan to use audiovisual for the room, there is a question uh, that is asked uh, for every room request, will you use AV? If you answer yes, then in um, February 28th, when you go in to start ordering, we will have already pre-selected your um, AV package. It'll be up to you to remove the AB, AV package um, from your um, room request. Um, but it, this allows the AV team to understand the volume of uh, services that they have to provide. And again, a reminder, which we mentioned earlier, is that um, Western University is a PC-based um, facility. Windows 2010 is, uh, at a minimum, the suite that's being used. And uh, each of the rooms that you ask for audiovisual in will have a uh, projector, a screen, or a video display. And uh, for any of the rooms that you've asked for that has a capacity of over 70, there will be one microphone included in that base package. Uh, if the room is smaller than 70, there will not be a microphone in the room. Whoops. Uh, catering. Uh, so for catering, uh, there are multiple teams within the university who come to together to create the catering menu um, that will service all the conference rooms. These food service options will range from breakfast to receptions to plated dinners. Some great examples are the, um, the breakfast breaks that we um, experience today and that we'll experience at lunch today. Um, and as I mentioned during uh, this afternoon's workshop, the chef will be taking us through the uh, menus and answering any of the questions that you may have. A lot of effort has gone into the creation of the menus and respect to this Congress, um, there is a policy to not have external catering come into um, to Congress. Uh, there have been situations in the past where associations have um, used a completely separate caterer to provide their uh, food for their events without the university's knowledge or chose to bring in outside food. By doing this, you're compromising the binding agreements that exist between the university's food service uh, provider and is putting your attendees at risk um, in the event of poorly stored food uh, items. So uh, your attendees won't know where that food came from. So they'll look to uh, Western and to the Federation and to your association to become accountable in the event. So uh, we implore you and um, ask you very, beg you, please do not bring in outside um, uh, catering. If you're looking to do something different or you want creative alternatives, reach out to the Congress uh, catering team uh, early and start the discussion. Uh, they'll work with you on menu, they'll work with you on pricing, and um, give you an opportunity to present something unique. If you have uh, a theme within your association, uh, for the most part, our, it is our intention from the chef's point of view. You can imagine um, having over 10,000 cups of coffee being delivered throughout campus and, and over a thousand sandwich packages going out to have a lot of custom menus out there can be a bit challenging, um, but they are open to having a discussion with you. So please, um, uh, uh, we would prefer you to talk to catering than to order uh, from another caterer. Um, so included um, in the planning guide, your, your catering menus, the catering, uh, catering, AV, and furnishings are ordered between February 28th and April 3rd. Um, we, 
uh, we would suggest don't wait to the last minute because if 70 different organizations are trying to place their orders in the last week of March, um, things can get a little awry. Um, software is only good for, um, it, it did survive last year during a very busy period, but if you want to go in and take a look and start to put in your simple orders and then work your way through it, uh, the system does allow you to um, return and, and do uh, updates and, and complete your orders. So I would ask you to um, start your planning uh, early and you have until April 3rd, midnight, to uh, finish those orders. One of the items that uh, we uh, started last year and was received very well by our organizers is we now ask your attendees for their dietary requirements, and those are now included. So in the organizers portal, in the reports section, um, we will have a dietary requirements uh, report available to you so that you can download and start to monitor uh, what type of um, food sensitivities uh, your attendees have, and you can use that to work through your catering menus. Greeting tables. I'll now pass it over to Nikki. <laughs> Hi again, I got the riveting topic of greeting tables to talk about. Um, so every association has the opportunity to request an association greeting table, which would be near your uh, allocated meeting space. They can be used to distribute your program, uh, other materials, and it's also a really great place for members to connect, as well as a place for any reporters and journalists to find you and find out information about your association. We highly recommend that you get a greeting table Although, fun fact, you do get one for free, so you can take advantage of that. It's a six-foot table with tablecloth and a chair. Um, any others that you're looking to order are $25 per day, and this is something that you need to request in order to receive them. Uh, they, unfortunately, don't magically appear, um, so there is a form in the organizer's portal which needs to be filled out by February 28th. If you do order greeting tables, um, the location will be discussed between yourself and the university based on your room assignment. The agreed upon location will then be listed in the Congress Essentials Guide and on the mobile app that is available to every Congress attendee. Once on site, it's very important to not move these tables. Um, if you didn't order one, you can't take one that you see down the hall. Um, because that table is likely for somebody else and they're wanting it. <laughs> um, so if you do have a greeting table, we will send your attendees to that location after they leave registration. So it's critical that your greeting table stays in the same place, isn't moved, and isn't taken by anybody else. Table signage uh, indicating which association is represented is recommended for uh, the reason for, in order to make sure people know that they're at the right greeting table and um, to make sure it's in the right location. Another riveting topic is the association assistant. Um, this is a really great option to help you at your greeting table to um, welcome attendees as they come to make sure nobody takes your greeting table um, and to help answer any questions that attendees may have. They respond to any uh, queries, they direct registered attendees to your events, um, they help sign for catering deliveries, and they can assist on pre-conference setup days with printing and uh, the collation of handouts or anything else. So the Federation facility, uh, facilitates the hiring and payment process for you, and the costs will be deducted from your Congress account after the event. The pay rate for 2020 is $15 an hour. We'll also manage the training of these assistants so that they're fully aware of Congress and its background, and these training hours aren't charged to the association. It's as a, one of your benefits of being a member. You can hire multiple assistants, just submit your request via the organizer's portal form by March 13th. An additional member benefit that we introduced last year and will continue for this year is that the Federation will provide uh, to those associations who order a greeting table, the use of one contractor association assistant for three and a half hours on the first morning of your conference at no charge. 
A team member from the Federation will reach out to you to confirm your interest in using this option once the greeting table forms have been received. This is on to Donna. Thank you. Okay, thanks Nikki. So, um, making your, uh, your meeting accessible. Um, so on to page 32 in your guide. Knowing how to accommodate the accessibility needs of your various attendees in advance of Congress is important so that you can determine what extra plans or equipment need to be prepared. To assist with this, the Federation includes an accessibility needs uh, section within the Congress registration form so that the attendees can self-identify their, their needs. Uh, these needs can range from specialized seating to sign language uh, interpretation and more. You will have access to this report from the organizer's portal if any of your attendees uh, provide a request. It's important to note, however, that you may not be uh, given the name of an, in of an individual if they have chosen not to disclose their uh, personal details with the association. In these cases, you will know their needs, but not who they are. Uh, the university will also receive a list of these needs so that um, you can open a dialogue on how uh, the needs can be met. The university will work with you to provide resources to meet these requests as their accessibility inventory allows. Should something be required to meet a request which the university does not normally provide, a cost or cost sharing scenario would be discussed between both parties. In addition to the needs self-identified by individual attendees, there um, are a number of things that you can do as an association organizer to, to prepare uh, an accessible conference. A list of some of these things are outlined on page 32 to 33 of your planning guide, and you can also contact the accessibility team working on Congress at logistics.congress2020 uh, at uwo.ca. Following on page 33 of your guide, on site during Congress, the Information Center is your one stop point for, infor for information on assistance. Staffed by the Federation and uh, Western Congress teams, we are available to assist you with any issues you may have on site and provide assistance during registration hours. A phone number will also be provided in your organizer's package when you check in at the registration on site. This phone number um, uh, you can use to contact us during Congress in the event you have issues with catering, AV, or furnishings. So from page 33 in the guide, as you commence your final arrangements for Congress, the question of sending association conference materials to Congress 2020 will be asked. We suggest that uh, before this becomes a last minute requirement uh, requirements for you, that you reach out to Western's Shipping and Receiving Department via the email address provided on the screen. Congress Shipping and Receiving will um, be able to provide you with the necessary information you need to get your shipments to Congress. So upon arriving uh, at Congress, um, there will be a variety of important information provided in your organizer's package in addition to the um, center phone line, which is why it's important that you pick up your package upon arriving at Congress. It may seem like a long time from now, but keep in mind that you'll need to go to the PC LAC labeled counter in the registration area to check in. They, there you will receive your organizer's package and registration credentials, which includes badge identifiers to signal that you are an association organizers both so that you can easily tell who to connect with on site, but also to recognize that your, your hard work, all the hard work that you've done. And it is important to, to come to, to registration. First of all, especially in the, maybe the first couple of days where the lineups are really busy, you can bypass them and come and see us so that you get everything you need and get through quickly. So, oops, are there any questions? Um, We'd invite you to come to the, to the microphone if you have any questions. Is it on? Um, I have actually a lot of questions, but I'm not going to ask a lot of questions right now. Um, 
uh, we're organizing our meeting for the Canadian Anthropology Society, which um, mostly has not met with Congress. So I'm trying to kind of navigate between what I know about our previous organizational activities and what it will be like to be with Congress. The last time we did it with Congress was, was 2010. Um, so just my one question for now is, in terms of thinking about um, promoting our uh, meeting uh, through a website, is it a normal practice for associations to have a separate um, website for their meetings, um, for their annual meeting, or would the page we would have within the Congress um, website be the, where, where associations would normally provide their information? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, what I would, my answer is a bit uh, uh, two-sided. So we have a lot of our associations that um, have an infrastructure that builds out an annual conference um, uh, web page on their uh, association website. And uh, what they do is they might have multiple pages, so it's very uh, extensive as far as information is available so that their membership knows where to go to understand what's happening with their annual conference. We have other associations whose infrastructure does not allow them to have a very complex annual conference website, and they may have just a single page uh, and do a lot of the directing back to the Congress website. As Nikki mentioned earlier today, we have um, on the Congress website, we have a, a, a section called programs and under that we have association conferences. That is where we list uh, a description of um, what your conference is going to be about and then at the appropriate time when your program is available and you've uploaded it through the organizers portal, it will appear on that um, conference website. Uh, during the process of uh, communication, we have starting in January, uh, well let me back up, in the fall we ask you for your membership list. It's a marketing list and Nicola is going to go into that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, that list is used to communicate to out to all of the members of all the associations participating, letting them know that registration is open. We then start to um, put messaging in the subsequent emails, uh, letting attendees who have not registered or members who have, or your mailing list, know um, where to go to find further information. So on our Congress website, we do uh, link back to your your, your corporate website, um, and we can also, um, or we do ask for your annual conference specific web page address. Um, but if it's not available, then uh, you can put more detail into uh, the Congress web, web page for your association. It was a little long winded, but I, I hope that helps. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Um, I have a question for you and one for Nikki, so maybe I'll start with yours so okay. that Nikki has time And then to Nikki can come up. Yeah. So um, in BC this year, we had a few sessions where people participated from elsewhere. And it was a bit complicated, of course, because you know I'm not sure how they went about it. You, have, you had to be quite savvy in terms of um, technology so that people could could um, give their presentation by Skype or Zoom or whatnot from the university uh, AV system. So we were wondering if you were thinking about establishing some hotspots in the, for Congress, some s special um, rooms whereby people could automatically have Zoom or Skype or a university software downloaded into the AV system so that if we do have people participating uh, virtually, that it could be done right away simply by clicking a certain button. 
So that's my question, the mm. first one. Okay. Um, I'm going to start the answer, but I may ask Cliff to come to the stage, please. Um, so uh, as a part of the room request uh, process, when uh, there's a comments box, uh, I would ask that if there is a room, a specific room that you're anticipating would require a virtual speaker presence, that you indicate that you are interested in having um, Skype available or uh, Zoom access, that type of thing. Um, that would be my, my knee-jerk response. And now I'm gonna turn to Cliff, who may just tell me I'm crazy. <laughs> no, uh, hi folks, a uh, really good question, Michelle. Um, one thing we're fortunate of here at Western is Zoom is our provider now for meetings. So I think we, it's important probably to start the conversation early and if you intend on using that component, I, maybe we just have a separate conversation and we can identify and that might help with the placement of the allocation of where we actually put the whole association so that it's easily you know, accessed depending on you know joint sessions or keynotes or a proximity on campus. It's been referenced Tetris a couple of times, but I kind of see it happening that way. Everything's kind of got to need to fit into that puzzle. Um, multiple buildings, it, there's just so many complexities uh, to it, but there's a whole team behind me. I don't do it alone. Um, there's a lot of great people here to help us figure that out, but we'll make it work for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cliff. You had a second question for Nikki? Yes. So I heard you mention about the app that um, associations can tap into. Yeah. So, and, but you mentioned cost. So do you have an idea of the cost? That's something we're working on. I don't know how much. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're just finalizing our contract uh, with the, organ, uh, with the, the app provider. Um, what we are anticipating is for Federation members, it'll be one price, and for Federation Congress Association and, um, groups that are participating that are not Federation members, uh, there'll be a higher price. Uh, because the uh, component is only the interactive agenda, uh, right now it's uh, definitely going to be under $1,000. We're looking at somewhere between $500 and $850, somewhere in that range. Um, uh, and then there'll be plus GST, but uh, that's kind of uh, the range that we're looking at. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to make sure that it's a, simple it's a simple enough process that it's not going to take a lot of labor resources uh, for an association uh, to be able to use it. Um, so th that we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about this afternoon, but that's kind of the tentative price range that we're looking at. Does that help, Michelle, to understand? Yes, it does. So I, I'm, I'm assuming that association members who are using that the app, they'll be able to manage it as well for their own associations within the app system. So they'll be able to manage their own agendas. Um, everything else that um, is a part of it will be still managed by the federation. Uh, we'll be using the Congress registration system to upload all the attendees. We'll be doing all the invites okay. for, you must log in to be able to see the attendee list. Um, we're just working out uh, how, for those, um, last year the, uh, the association conferences, if you went into the app, uh, and it was a bit clunky, but it, it was our first year. We had PDFs of everyone's as association conference. So for those associations that don't want to opt into uh, the interactive agenda part, we will still need to um, upload their PDF uh, into the app uh, again this year. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I have two very quick questions. The $15 an hour that you, to pay the assistance, mm -hmm. is that plus benefits plus vacation? That includes those um, items. So the, the minimum wage, I believe, is, um, is less than that. For, it's $14 something as of January, or it's been delayed. But that also includes the uh, 4%. Vacation entitlement? Vacation time, yeah. Okay, my second question is even simpler. Um, you were saying that we would have from February 10th until February 28th 
to check rooms and get back to you. Yes. On the screen and in our documents, it says February 21st. And the only reason I'm asking is that's break week. Uh, it's during reading week. It is until the 21st, right? That's, that's reading week for Western? Right. So it, it'll go through to the 28th, which will fall the week after reading week. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate it. Hi, I'm one of the local area coordinators, but for me, local is Brescia, not main campus. So I'm wondering about the possibility of space at the affiliates being part of what's used for Congress as opposed to this main campus. Cliff, do you want to take that? Good question. Absolutely. Um, I guess the... The, sh the short answer is we could maybe talk about it a little bit farther. Um, the room inventory that we've, pro we've basically provided to the Federation and what we've secured ac across campus doesn't include the affiliates. So most of the, the things that you need to do with regards to catering and AV and all the support to do Congress um, and under that big umbrella will happen here on main campus. So we don't intend on placing anybody at the affiliates. Um, we're kind of treating like an on-campus, off-campus partner. Um, we have the support of all the affiliates during Congress, but we, our intention would be to try and make everything happen here. So if there's something that you specifically want to do at one of the affiliates, um, we're going to have to talk about transportation, which might be a cost to the association back to it, uh, depending on which one, as well as what you maybe need, because uh, not everything's integrated, as you can appreciate. We kind of operate independently, but talk further with me for sure. Um, if there's something unique at, at Russia within one of the food labs, then you know it makes sense to happen there and we could just talk about that further, but there would be some different costs probably to make that happen um, and to su provide you the support that you need. I wasn't thinking in terms of like regularly scheduled okay. sessions, but just in terms of a reception or a reading or something like that as opposed to, you know, a panel session. For sure. So um, I'm going to make a little bit more reference to that uh, this afternoon, uh, just after lunch about special spaces and what's available. Um, we would totally encourage you to, to, to kind of get off campus and do something at Ivy Spencer or Huron or Kings or even Windermere Manor in Brescia because they're kind of within our big portfolio. Sorry, that gets in the way. Um, <laughs> For sure, uh, it makes complete sense because it's kind of convenient for all the members, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Cliff. Another question? Could I just ask you to say a little bit more about what the app will look like and what you mean by an interactive feature? Last year, the app was pretty much composed of PDFs, um, which didn't make for much interactivity. Um, and if the buy-in this year is 500 to 800, that's a pretty high price. Um, in fact, associations could set up their own apps for that amount of uh, buy-in. So I'm just wondering, I mean, obviously the ideal is to be able to coordinate schedules with all the different associations. Um, is that gonna be possible? Um, we will talk about it. We don't, um, I, I don't know we can get back into last year's app to demonstrate it, but um, when the app was being used last year, the agenda page, if I can use that as a, a reference, uh, it, it was uh, detailed by day and then by start time. So it's um, our intent um, that as the day sequence uh, follows along, any events that are starting at 8 a.m., uh, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and following uh, will continue, and that'll be on the open events side. When it comes to the association conferences, the asso if the association conference starts at 9 a.m., it's going to fall into the time sequence at that. You'll op you'll, you, the plan is that you'll click on that association that's starting at 9 a.m., and inside we'll give the full schedule for that association for the day. And then if you have a concurrent session, you would click on that and it would open up and it would list your four or five speakers that are in that specific concurrent session. If you have descriptions, um, it'll be there. The other piece for us also is that with a, a bilingual mandate, uh, if your association also has that mandate, you'll be able to enter the same uh, session 
in uh, English as well as in French. So as a attendee user, they can choose to either um, follow the mobile app in English or in French and the uh, agenda would be respected. For those associations that are only using English, the English will appear both on the English side of the app as well as the French side. So it's really just access to the schedules of each of the associations. That is you correct. You can't like, mix and match or set up a, an individualized schedule. I'm, I'm, oh, oh, I'm asking because... As an attendee? As an attendee? Yeah, oh, definitely. So last year's app, the attendee would go in, they would, uh, if I can use the term, they would shop through the schedule. Okay, I'm going to be on campus on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. My association events don't start until Tuesday. So they can actually create a personalized agenda and slot in uh, to their calendar what sessions in the open events uh, that are available. And any of, um, uh, and then when it comes to Tuesday, they can start personalizing their agenda within their association as well as the open events. Thank you. Does that help? Thank you. Quick question regarding catering. Um, so last year at UBC, I, I thought it was wonderful that um, there were so many uh, options for composting and recycling of our things, because in the past, I know Ryerson, other universities, there have been tons of waste, and I always feel so wonderful about this gathering, but also terrible about the amount of waste that it generates. And I'm not sure if that's uh, a practice that was in place because it was UBC, or if Congress uh, really made that request to the university and if that's something that's going to be respected this year at Western? I'll ask Cliff to answer but it is a very good question and uh, a lot of our attendee surveys reacted uh, very positively uh, to that experience and I'll let uh, Cliff uh, take us from there. No, for sure, I appreciate the question. Um, a lot of great things happening with regards to sustainability. Um, chefs and Chef and uh, Craig are going to speak to that a little bit more this afternoon. Uh, there's some good things in the works. We, uh, this past summer, hosted a group, and I'll just tell the story real quickly and give you a bit of an idea of what we're doing. Um, we had some recycle sta stations set up, something specific, because we had 1,600 visitors here on our hill. Um, we had a bunch of students here from the sustainability team and our facility partners actually help sort and uh, get everything into the right stream. So they, we provided a level of support, a little bit different. So what you see or you might walk across, uh, walk into, um, today or maybe yesterday, uh, there's an extension of that. So there'll be some centers for sure, fully compostable, you know, spoons, uh, serving trays, um, a lot of good things in, in the works. Um, so there's more to come, for, but yes, in big picture, 100%. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, our, uh, we're working on a little bit of an overtime here, so um, what I'd like to um, offer is if anyone wants to take a health break and grab a coffee, uh, we're going to make this a very short break, and then we'll have Nicola come up and um, uh, speak to us, and Nicola is going to be between you and lunch. <laughs> so uh, if you would like to take a quick health break and grab a, another coffee, we'll be back with you in, in a few minutes. I'll go ahead and get started. We're on an accelerated schedule, so I will move along quickly. But I am uh, going to speak about four things, mailing lists, branding guidelines, media work, and social media, and how we can help get word out about your conference. So we can help you promote your conference, and that is one of our very big jobs coming up first. Uh, we will be requesting uh, by November 2nd your CASEL compliant mailing lists. CASEL stands for Canadian Anti-Spam Legislation. Relatively new, it basically gives, uh, puts the onus of uh, securing permission to send electronic messages to uh, people in Canada. The onus is, is on us and on you as an association to ensure that you have permission. So there is a URL in your, in your guide um, where you can learn more, but essentially it's anyone who in the last 24 months has given you permission to contact them and has interacted with your association. So 
we can help you and we would like to help you uh, make, make sure that we get a really good list from you. We've provided a template and we can answer your questions about casual compliance. The privacy is, is really important for us. We will be using the lists only a certain number of times. We will be pro providing um, promotion in the form of a registration postcard, which is a physical postcard that goes out um, in, t in coordination with the opening of registration. And we will be sending out six registration emails. Once a person is registered, they are removed from those lists and they, we don't bother them again. Um, to prompt them to register because they have registered. They then move on to other types of emails. So but we will be sending out information about which associations are attending, how to plan your trip, how to register, important keynotes, local attractions, um, accommodations information. So we are trying to help build up your audience for your, for your programs. Next, we're going to move on to... Um, the visual toolkit. This is to help you make your programs, your websites, and all of your printed materials beautiful. <laughs> so we've got, we've got a lot of different um, tools for you and a visual toolkit that will be placed on the organizers portal starting, which will open up on Monday, the 30th. In there you'll see Congress 2020 logos, Western logos, Federation logos, Big Thinking logos. We'll also be providing elements um, that will help you make a letterhead. There will be an actual letterhead. You can also create one with the elements we've provided. There's a poster. You can put it up in your office or around your institutions. Um, there's a PowerPoint template. If you'd like to use that, you're welcome to. There's an email signature, which you can place in your emails, specifically when you're emailing about Congress. Um, we'll begin using that right after this meeting, as will Western, uh, for their for their Congress uh, communication purposes. And there'll also be Congress 2020 boilerplates, which is language you can use when you're asked about what is Congress and what is this year's theme and what is this year's um, host all about. We do have we do provide some guidance on how to use the logos, because. There are lots of them. There are hor horizontal versions, vertical versions, bilingual versions, unilingual versions, <laughs> black and white versions, full color. Um, we ask you uh, to, to follow some of the guidelines that we provide. Again, this will be in your visual toolkit. We also provide some what not to do guidelines. Uh, these look funny, but you'll be surprised how creative our members can be. So we ask that you please do not add special effects, different colors. Um, um, <laughs> or we ask you that you don't distort the logo, basically, to try and uh, promote, uh, keep the brand uh, healthy. Next, I'll talk about media outreach. Our membership has varying levels of capacity and interest in, in, uh, in media work, but we're here to provide support for you. We work very closely with the Western media and communications teams to ensure that media is aware of the event, uh, it's a lot of programming that they need to navigate, so we do help with that. We do a media tour in advance of Congress. We feed them stories. We build up story lists. We do a lot of prep work with them. That's really important, and we can work with you to ensure that we have the stories that you think should be percolating to the top from your programming. It's really a good chance to put our research in front of the, the Canadian public and in front of colleagues that you don't normally interact with. Um, by getting it into mainstream media, magazines, online platforms that you may not normally get published in. We always try to measure our success in, uh, in getting media attention. So I've put some uh, numbers here from last year. Last year we actually had 824 mm -hmm. media stories. Over on this side you see where. They're not mutually exclusive, but you can see that absolutely online is where the stories are, are happening. We did have some radio and some TV, always exciting, um, but basically a lot of online coverage. 19 institutions were featured, 19 associations were featured in 10 countries and three languages, which were English, French, and Cantonese. Uh, we categorize our stories as either big picture or research specific. 
uh, big picture being uh, about Congress at large, th the event, what it means for Canada, um, and then the research stories are specifically about one or two or three researchers on a specific topic. So again, that breakdown was 47 big picture stories, 765 new researcher stories. You're probably wondering which associations get the most attention, and that really does vary. There are some, uh, there's a very broad interest in what kind of stories the media will pick up. Uh, so I've put down here for the last four years which associations received the highest number of stories. Last year, uh, I actu have actual numbers. Um, Canadian Society for the History of Medicine had 205 stories. Uh, Canadian Sociological Association had 106 stories. And there was a tie for third place between the Canadian Pho Pho Philosophical Association and the Canadian Society for the Study of Practical Ethics. They each had 104 stories. And there was a really close runner-up. So Food Studies, Canadian Association of Food Studies had 98. So really a lot of pickup across um, Canada and beyond. We have, I should put a shout out to a National Post. They are a really strong supporter of Congress and they actually run a series every year called Oh the Humanities. Last year they ran more, more stories than usual. They ran 10, 10 stories. Um, they even went beyond Congress, which was surpri a surprise for us. They went like four days beyond Congress, but they typically publish a story every day uh, during Congress. So if you get a call from me about National Post, please return my call. So what can you do to help us? There are lots of things you can do. It's important for us to get really great programs from you. We are promoting these programs to the media. We're encouraging them to go and read them and select researchers. Uh, and we're also choosing stories ourselves uh, that we're pitching actively to, re uh, to, uh, to the media. So if you can work with your, uh, your program planning team and with your individual researchers to ensure that the abstracts are short, succinct, meaningful, tied to current events, um, written in a punchy, interesting manner. That'll really help. It'll help to get the attention. Um, if you have VIPs or high profile speakers that we may miss in our scanning, we're scanning a lot of programming, um, let us know. Don't be shy to send us an email and say, we've got this great speaker coming in from Europe and this one's gonna get some attention. We can work with you to help make sure that they're on our, on our radar. If you're doing any um, media outreach yourselves, let us know. We can help to cross-promote that and put, um, put the media releases in the, in the office. We have a media office uh, that we have open the whole week of Congress. We can help to promote your, your media work as well if you're doing it independently. And we need your programs. May 1st is our final program date, but we'll take drafts starting as early as February and we'll start scanning them already. So give us your drafts as well. Um, in April, we'll be, be reaching out to all speakers and presenters uh, that have registered up to that point and open up our media opt-in program. It is actually optional. So if you don't want media, your research is not ready or there's some sensitivity about your research, you do not have to be included in the promotion. We do seek everyone's permission prior to promoting. So, but you can be ready in April to uh, opt into the program and they'll, your, your research and your members' research will be, become part of our roster and we'll be promoting that actively in those last six weeks before Congress. That's a really heavy time for us. Important um, to remember and to emphasize with your members is that quick response is really important. Media has a very short attention span and really short timelines. So if we're not responding quickly with uh, contact information and, and just uh, ways to be in touch with researchers, they're gonna move on to the next one. So it's important to respond quickly. Okay, final section is on uh, social media. We have lots of platforms that we can help um, share, that we share with you as our members um, to help promote your material. I'd say first and foremost is our blog. We run a blog um, that we publish regularly. And if you've got interesting 
topics, if you've got an interesting area of research that you're featuring this year, um, please reach out to our, our communications team. I'll put an email up. Um, we can run a, an interesting blog about what your, what your program is all about this year, or if you've got a really specific um, event in your program that you'd like to promote, let us know. It's, it's a well-read blog, and it's, it's a good platform, and it's available to you. We're active on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, if you have those kinds of accounts within your associations, if you can make sure that you're connected with us and um, interacting with us, we can help to cross-promote all the work you're putting there. We, are not, we do not uh, maintain an Instagram account, but it is a place where you can use the hashtag, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, and we are seeing it getting used more and more uh, with the younger researchers, so it's, it's on our radar, and we, will, we, can, we don't actively um, maintain it, but we can support it with, with the hashtag. I'll take a moment just on Twitter. If you can ensure that you are connected with us if you are on Twitter, it's a really big platform during Congress. We have thousands of tweets. We estimate uh, from our stats last year that 35% of attendees are active to some degree. Some are only a little bit active and some are quite active. There's lots of room for growth. So if you're active on Twitter or thinking about it, then do connect with us. You can please use the hashtag as it, exists, uh, as it is, which is hashtag Congress. It's bilingual, it works. Um, if you try to alter it, it makes it harder for people to, to find it and find you and find your uh, commentary. So please try and use it as it is. Um, we also have lists. If you go to our account and you look at our lists, you can see lists of um, interesting media and member and university. And anyway, there are different lists that you can subscribe to them and then um, have contact through your social media to the same groups of people. That'll help you become more connected. So final thoughts. Um, then I'm gonna pass it on to Nikki. Send us great programs. We will go through them and we will work with you to make sure that we have a great roster that we're pitching. Keep us in the know, keep us in the loop if you've got something interesting specifically that you'd like us to uh, have an, uh, our, keep an eye on. And then be active with us on social media and we can cross promote a lot of good work that you're doing. That's my email, um, but it's also in your, in your book. Um, so you can reach out anytime. I think I'm not allowed to ask for questions because we're moving on. But I'll take questions later and over lunch. Thanks, Nicola. Um, so I'm gonna try and make this short and sweet because I think we're all hungry. Um, accommodations. We've been working really hard for a couple years now to make sure we have a good uh, selection of accommodation options for you and your attendees. Um, so booking at an official <laughs> um, booking at an official Congress hotel means staying near other attendees, allowing for more networking opportunities, which is really great. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we uh, encourage everyone to book with an official Congress hotel, um, but it also helps us in negotiating hotel room rates for future Congresses um, and keeps the pricing nice and competitive. So we have a large selection of rooms uh, available both on campus as well as off campus. I skipped ahead, sorry. Um, so uh, on page 38 of your guide, you'll see that Western uh, University has a number of uh, residence buildings available to your attendees. These range from traditional dorm rooms to shared apartments to individual suites. Uh, anyone who's participating in the orientation tour this afternoon will have a chance to see some of these rooms and all information has actually already been posted to the Congress website, so go check that out. Uh, they've already actually had their first uh, reservation, I think it was Saturday, which is super exciting because the info just went live on Friday. Yay. Uh, in terms of off-campus accommodations, we have a large number of hotel rooms uh, within close proximity to Western. Each hotel sets aside a different number of rooms available for Congress. So if you're interested in reserving 
uh, a portion of rooms in a specific hotel for your members, please feel free to reach out to our contacts, which they're listed on our website, um, and use the booking codes published on the accommodations site so that they know what they're, you're talking about. <laughs> It's also important that all organizers understand that neither the Federation nor Western University uh, utilize the services of any housing accommodation vendors. Please don't make arrangements with or provide credit card information to any vendor who contacts you directly to offer assistance with booking accommodations because this could be a scam. To travel, transportation and amenities, um, I'll, it's all coming to the website shortly uh, in waves. It'll all be live before registration opens. There's going to be information on discounts for certain airlines, car rental companies, and other travel options. There will be maps available, tourism um, opportunities, local transportation options, food outlets, campus services, et cetera, that will help you and your attendees have uh, the best stay and Congress possible. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Um, just to add on to the plan your trip, we're working with uh, Tourism London and uh, there will be a um, shuttle system from the downtown hotels out to the campus uh, with a badge. Uh, so uh, that program hasn't been completely flushed out that we have the actual explanation for you, but it is something exciting that um, the city has really gotten behind uh, Western Universities. Uh, hosting uh, Congress 2020 and uh, more information on that will be uh, offered up. Uh, this is the conclusion of um, today. Uh, I'm just going to ask Cliff uh, to come up because we just wanted to uh, talk about um, what uh, this afternoon looks like and I'll start with Cliff and uh, the orientation tour and we'll go from there. Um, it's lunchtime, which is wonderful. Um, none, of th none of the things that I do, I do alone. Uh, there's a great team uh, here in the room uh, that was here this morning, and then there's a lot of people out there that are gonna help pull this uh, Congress together. Um, we're here for you. Um, this is probably the last time we're here together in the room before we break out into some workshops after lunch, but there's a lot of expertise out there. Um, there's some great systems in place with the Federation. They've got a lot of history there. They're there to also help us and guide us through Congress, but um, a lot of these logistical things are there for a reason, and it makes sense, but we'll help you navigate. So don't feel like you're here. Um, it's your first time, you've never done this before. Mary and I are gonna completely support you um, and help answer the, the right questions. So those email addresses in your guide and uh, that you've seen on your screen, reach out to them. There's somebody on the other end that will answer. Based on the volume, it might take a couple of days. It's not as instantaneous as some things, but it is time for lunch. But before we break for lunch, I just wanted to make mention of, of Mike and Brady who are at the back of the room there. They're gonna help uh, us out with uh, some tours. There's a couple of tours that are specifically designed on a to, to hit a couple of different things. And I'll let ta them talk about it a little bit more, but there's a couple of different residence options that they're gonna visit. Um, and one tour is a little bit more designed for uh, event spaces and special spaces that uh, it could be utilized for your association programming. And the other one is more of the, the, where the expo is. I don't think both tours are going to the expo hub, but so you can get a, your feel of campus a little bit more. Those of you from Western might just get that right away, but um, others, uh, visitors, please take advantage of those two tours. If you have signed up for them, um, they're aware of it, but don't feel free, don't feel that you can't join one. Um, this afternoon, um, I'm gonna be in here with the logistics kind of team and the programming team's gonna be right across the hall. So we're gonna break out into two different groups and I think Sonia is gonna lead that one. Um, that's at 1.30 and we're gonna stick to the schedule. We're gonna try to, yeah. Perfect, and then lunch is available. Um, I've got the, the thumbs up that we're good to go. If you have any dietary concerns or you wanna speak to a, a member of the catering team, please go, just approach them um, and we can help navigate through the buffet or they might even have a special meal prepared for you. Well, uh, in closing, thank you so much for your patience and your attention to, uh, to this morning. Uh, there was a lot of information shared with you 
uh, we are very excited about coming to Western and, and uh, uh, experiencing Congress uh, 2020 in, in London, Ontario. Um, your contributions, um, we can't thank you enough. Uh, you are amazing to take on this responsibility. And as Cliff has said, we're only an email away. Um, we will help you however we can. Uh, we don't want this to be a burdens burdensome uh, task. Uh, there is a lot of details, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, on behalf of the Federation team uh, and the, the, um, the Western University team, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have lunch. We're going to uh, come uh, resume at uh, 1.30, uh, as Cliff had said. And uh, we'll take the workshop through till about we might be speeding this up a little bit for Mike and uh, Brady, but um, we're hoping the workshops aren't going to be more than 45 minutes to an hour. So that should take us to 2.30. We were talking about orientation tour originally around 3. Um, do you want us to still hold to 3 o'clock for the start of the orientation tour, Mike and Brady? Okay. Okay. All right. So flexibility is the key, uh, and I appreciate that, Brady. Thank you. So um, enjoy lunch. Get up, um, mingle, and uh, enjoy uh, the beautiful uh, food uh, display that they've uh, Westerns provided. Thank you, Jeff. Is there anything? No, you're all okay. All right. Thank you.